all over country we have been doing this one uh, since 2020 in september ka ye jo abhi jo kar rahe hai na ye jo project eco ke sath jo kar rahe hai so that's been a monthly activity beech mein do months uh, covid jab peak pe tha we did not do otherwise we have been doing it as a monthly activity so usually we have good attendance let's see how aaj kitne log aate we have around 190 odd uh, registrations liye aaj ke liye पर आपको वो स्लाइड्स मिल गए थे ना जी हां जी वेल कोऑर्डिनेट बाय यू वेल कोऑर्डिनेटेड नाइस सर जस्ट जॉइन कर ये वो उसका होता है सर का बैनर पर महेंद्र ये जितने रजिस्ट्रेशन थे उनको एक बार और आप सर डॉक्टर डीके गुप्ता सर ज्वाइन कर रहे हैं तो सर वहाँ है नाम्स में है सर उनका कुछ फंक्शन है सर इनको ज्वाइन कर रहे हैं तो संजय मैम
नहीं है नहीं नहीं अभी अभी ये पीछे होगा आगे नहीं होगी ये we are not able to get good afternoon madam gupta ji good afternoon information madam hello madam मैडम गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीवन गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीवन ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ द सुपर स्पेशलिटी पीडियाट्रिक हॉस्पिटल एंड पोस्ट ग्रेजुएट टीचिंग इंस्टीट्यूट आई एक्सटेंड अ वार्म वेलकम टू ऑल द ऑल ऑफ यू हैव जॉइंड इन टुडे सिंस ओवर अ ईयर वी हैव बीन कंडक्टिंग दिस प्रोग्राम called uh, SSPHPGTA project echo monthly online training program and uh, the first uh, four sessions happened in uh, 2020 september and for subsequently it's been a monthly program so the program which is um, organized being organized today is um, being organized with our department of pediatric hematology oncology in association with the department of transfusion medicine at our institute and the theme for today is transfusion guidelines in neonates and children so our program is being organized with support from national health mission blood cell with support from project echo which is a teleconsultation platform and from the indian academy of pediatrics uttar pradesh as well as aop noida branch uh, noida branch we are also um, honored to have national academy of medical sciences and uh, to organize this program today's program under the aegis of national academy of medical sciences which is conducting its convocation tomorrow the 60th convocation of nams nams is an academic institute under the ministry of health and family welfare which fosters academic excellence uh, to meet social and medical goals so nams has been a prestigious organization which um, honors for members and fellows uh, on the basis of their academic excellence and we are joined by uh, uh, members from nams today we have uh, professor chudamani gopal professor rani kumar and professor dk gupta sir from nams who are joining us today so the program today will be this is the institute that this is the um, timeline of events for today we'll have a first session which consists of three talks followed by a second session which is a case discussion session so as per the eco program we uh, generally make it a case based discussion to address common issues pertaining to the topic so those of you who have joined earlier would know that we have done similar programs with pathology as well as with transfusion medicine so we discuss common issues that come up in clinical practice and how um, as um, with collaborative efforts we are able to sort it out so before i proceed with the program i would i also like to invite uh, shrimati vinita shrivastava ma'am ma'am is advisor for the ministry of health and family welfare ma'am has joined today so uh, ma'am if you could say a few words on this occasion before we proceed
Sudah. गाइडलाइंस आ गए if you see in the entire country where the blood bags the adult blood bags are being utilized for the pediatric ones so this is a big concern for all of us and when uh, we were de deciding that how to go about it neither the nbtc or any of the organization has come up with those things which are very important while we talk about the pediatric blood transfusion the second thing which i was finding that uh, we need to have certain uh, important aspects which can be taken care here in your cme and with your experts over here who can design that how we have to go for the transfusion and the multiple transfusion also because the children like hematology children about thalassemia children they required the multiple transfusion and what exactly the requirements are there and in the neonatals as well as because you can very well detect the uh, the thalassemia in the early ages so it's like in one year or two year two years so we can very well guess it out the the child is thalassemia so those things has to be kept in mind and regarding the other uh, disorders which are very important nowadays and it is upcoming uh, we can see in the hospitals that we have uh, much of the registry as that day i was talking to dr neeta that he said ki nahi ma'am hamare paas itni registry to hai so that is a big concern to all of us and we don't have such things with us so my only concern is ki these things has to be checked out and especially when we talk about tribals it's like ki addiction is there तो वहां पे अनिमिया इतना ज्यादा हो जाता है देन वी हैव टू गिव ट्रांसफ्यूजन मेनी टाइम्स व्हिच आई एम रीडिंग फ्रॉम वन ऑफ द रिपोर्ट्स ऑफ खाका सो दिस इज ऑल वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट एट वाइल वी डू दी सीएमईज एंड लर्न दीस आर थिंग्स आर आल्सो टू बी केप्ट इन माइंड व्हाइल वी डिस्कस अबाउट अदर थिंग्स आल्सो एंड थर्ड थिंग व्हिच इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट अबाउट दी प्रोसेसिंग व्हिच वी अंडरस्टैंड दैट प्रोसेसिंग इज इंपॉर्टेंट वी ओनली डू दी फाइव मैंडेटरी टेस्ट व्हिच आर इंपॉर्टेंट but other processing which are required for these uh, uh, pediatric patients should be kept in mind so that is not been defined anywhere which i am finding so it is not been defined so these things if the cme can come up with such things and such issues this will be very helpful and within i can say ki agar teen char panno mein ye cheeze kuch ikatti ho sake to that will be a great uh, uh, part to play for this so my only concerns is that ki now the things are coming up and we uh, the blood is like ki we don't have to think only for uh, one part but pediatric is one of the very important aspect where we have to and today we had a meeting with js rch who is a reproductive and child health care js he was also saying the same thing that something has to come up so uh, now the meeting is at 4 uh, quarter to 4 and i will be going for the meeting to discuss all those things i will also discuss these things uh, where you guys can be a uh, help to me to divide it or define these guidelines into this thank you so much thank you ma'am um we are joined by uh, professor dk gupta sir sir is professor department of pediatric surgery is previously the director at our institute sir has been the professor and head of department of pediatric surgery at dean <laughs> delhi <laughs> and the vice chancellor of pgmu lucknow <laughs> we would request sir to say a few words on this occasion uh, uh on behalf of the national academy we have the pleasure to welcome uh, holding this eco program on the guidelines for the blood transfusion for neonates and children i have here professor 
Churamani Gopal, the President of the National Academy, Professor Rani Kumar, the Council Member of the National Academy. Let me uh, give the mic uh, first to Dr. Churamani Gopal to welcome you all on behalf of the Academy. Thank you, sir. Hello, Dr. Nita. Uh, thank you so much for organizing the CME under the aegis of the National Academy of Medical Sciences. The subject that has been chosen is really of great relevance, not only the, to the public, but more to the doctors. The pediatric and new needs have their requirements of blood much different than the adults. And what the agony is that we really do not know how should the transfusion be best suited to this age group? How should this be best collected? And how should this be best uh, dispensed with? Because the collection of blood for, uh, is like for any adult, the requirement of newborns may be just about 50 ml or 60 ml. And then what to do? Uh, what a wastage of uh, blood. And therefore, in these deliberations, when you are taking, uh, taking up, you must may have to come up with uh, in stimu stimulating some biomedical scientists, not only just the doctors, how to make a small, a small portions available as per need, not as per divide, division at the time of need. It must be made available in small quotas to help many more patients than what usually could be done. And of course, um, how to prevent uh, the hazards of blood transfusion in young babies uh, would be highlighted. And thank you very much for um, taking up this so relevant uh, subject for CME. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Gopal. Uh, Nita, once again, I wish to uh, thank you for all your efforts and also uh, the support uh, from the blood bank by Dr. Seema Dua Satyam and the team who have been doing uh, really very hard work uh, and keeping themselves with the recent advances in all fields, whether to develop the department, uh, with the advancements in the equipments, the technology, and developing the new, new, newer techniques with cutting edge technology uh, in the department. Uh, as we all know, a lot of changes have happened during the past 20 years or so for the transfusion, uh, especially in the newborns and children. Their basic requirements, uh, for surgical conditions, infections, exchange transfusions, hemophilias, thalassemias, and uh, several other conditions. Uh, from the blood bank point of view, uh, for all the participants in this group, are uh, to remember three S. One is the uh, supply. There was a time when there was an acute crisis and so far we don't have any source of an artificial blood. So each drop of the uh, uh, blood collected uh, from the voluntary donors has to be fully utilized and justified. Second is the storing. And uh, storing is something that not much attention has been given and a lot of blood has been wasted in several centers. So uh, with judicious knowledge, planning, and proper storage, certainly this aspect can serve the, uh, uh, serve a lot many more patients uh, from, without waste of the blood components. Uh, and uh, third one is of course, uh, the judicious use uh, prop with proper indications. Uh, blood is considered like a, a transplant these days. And so transfuse only and only if it is really indicated. The dictum is avoid if it could be because the complications are too many. Future 
problems could occur. Hence, I'm sure all these things will be discussed when you deliberate uh, under the CME program for all the participants. Uh, so on behalf of the academy, I wish to convey my best wishes and academy is very much happy to get associated with this CME program uh, today. So thank you once again, and I wish you all the best. Dr. Rani Kumar is here to say thanks again. Nita, thank you so much for your illustrative talk. It's so difficult to give transfuse in newborns and children. And you people have taken up this task and you have made it simplified. I hope the fellows who are new in the field of this transfusion may pick up this as a, their research topic and expertise in this. So your talk was, has, would be very, very fruitful to the new fellows and members. Thank you so much for your such a good talk. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Professor Ani Kumar and Professor Chudamani Gopal for those uh, words of uh, encouragement. And uh, as discussed, I think this is a topic where a lot of youngsters can uh, work on and uh, bring in results from research as well to bring out indigenous guidelines for our country. So thank you again. And thanks to National Academy of Medical Sciences for uh, allowing us to organize this program under their ages. Uh, moving on with the program. Uh, we have the first session where we will have, be having three talks on different components of blood transfusion. And uh, it's my honor to in, uh, invite the chairpersons for this session. We have Professor D.K. Singh, sir is Professor, Department of Pediatrics at our institute. Sir has previously served as a professor and head of department at Allahabad Medical College. And he's the currently serving as the chief medical superintendent of our in, uh, institute. Sir's active interests include uh, HIV, thalassemia, and pediatric cancer patients. We also are joined by our second chairperson, Dr. Sanjay Niranjan. Sir is a senior consultant pediatrician at New Child Clinic in Lucknow. He's done his um, DCH from KGMU and MD from Jhansi, and he's uh, worked in KGMU subsequently before going into private practice. And he's had a lot of, um, he's wearing a lot of hats. He has been national EB member of the Indian Academy of Pediatrics for two consecutive years. And he's been the president of NNF and president of IAP Lucknow. And he's been an organizing secretary for various uh, state and national level conferences. On behalf of the Institute, we welcome you, sir. Now I would like to request Dr. Sanjay Niranjan to kindly introduce the first speaker of today, Dr. Seema Dua. Thank you, Dr. Nita. Thank you, Academy of Pediatrics Uttar Pradesh and Academy of Pediatrics Noda for inviting me. And my uh, uh, regards to Dr. Saroj Churamani Gopal, who had been uh, we see being at Lucknow, I had the opportunity to meet Madam as well as Dr. D.K. Gupta in 2013 with Dr. D.K. Gupta. We accompanied to the Chief Minister also, and he took the KGMU to the higher and higher grades in uh, state. So uh, uh, without waiting much, I will first introduce the speaker of today, Dr. Seema Duga. She is a graduate from Parangabad Medical College, postgraduate in pathology from Grant Medical College, and faculty in the Department of Pathology, Iluru, and then at SMS and R, Greater Noida. And she has guided many PG students through their thesis. She is blood bank in charge at SMS and R from 2012 to 16 and joined Superspecialty Children's Hospital and is associate professor currently with transfer medicine in January since January 2017. Currently, she is additional professor in the same institute. Several publications in national and international journals. Areas of interest are hematology, transfusion, transmitted infections, and immunohematology. Organizing chairperson of 2017 workshop and CME on transfusion medicine at Noida, and organizing chairperson of workshop of basic immunohematology in February 2019. So, since uh, as introduced earlier, we have got moved from whole blood transfusion to blood components, and all the blood components they have got different life, different storage temperatures. So how to prepare them, how to store these components, it becomes a, a very big issue along with the pathophysiology of pediatric age group. Dr. Seema Duga, floor is yours. 
Thank you, sir. I would to request Dr. Seema to kindly share her uh, screen. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your kind words. From the beginning. Yes, ma'am. Uh, slide share also. Just a minute, just. Is my screen uh, visible, Dr. Neeta? Yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to welcome everyone for this monthly training session uh, held at SSPH PJ online training program. And I would like to congratulate Dr. Neeta for the same for organizing uh, similar training programs every month. Uh, today's topic, as we know, is on the transfusion medicine. And I'll be talking about blood component preparations and their storage. Uh, to begin with, as we know, uh, this component therapy has been uh, is a re recent thing. It is introduced some three to four decades uh, in the past. Prior to that, there was only whole blood which was issued to the patient, but it caused unnecessary administration of all the components, all the constituents of blood which may or may not be needed in the particular patient. Later on, the significant advancement that happened in transfusion medicine. The various equipments that became available, different kinds of blood bags that became available, and the preservative solutions, these made the uh, component therapy possible everywhere. Uh, if we look at the historical background, in 1926, first human transfusion was done by the British Red Cross Society in uh, 1926. In 1940, the freeze-dried plasma was developed during the uh, Second World War. Uh, in 1950, glycerol cryoprotectant for freezing red blood cells was developed. And in the same year, plastic bags for uh, storing whole blood were developed. In 1979, anticoagulant preservative CPDA1 was developed because of which it, it was feasible to have blood for, to store uh, PRPC or whole blood for 35 days. So all these were the uh, smaller milestones, which later on led to the component therapy. Before starting with the components, we need to know several terms. The whole blood, which means unseparated blood that collects from a donor in a bag, in a plastic storage bag, which has anticoagulant, uh, anticoagulant as a preservative solution. Components are the therapeutic parts or constituents of blood which are, which are prepared from whole blood, like red cell, plasma, platelet, and cryoprecipitate. Plasma derivatives, these are the plasma proteins which are prepared under pharmaceutical conditions like albumin, different proteins, and coagulation factors. There are various terms that appear in the component when we study about the components. These are closed system. That means a system where the sterility of blood is maintained. That means it is not exposed to air or outside environment. And the open system is a, is a condition when the collection is exposed to air and this exposure to air reduces its, its expiration date or the shelf life of the blood component. Uh, coming to the collection basics, that is how we collect the blood from a donor. Blood is collected in a primary bag that contains anticoagulant. These anticoagulant these minimize the biochemical changes in red cells and increase the shelf life of blood. These anticoagulants, they can be ACD, CPD, CPDA1, or sagum uh, with mannitol, which is an additive solution. The shelf life of whole blood or red cell depends upon the anticoagulant which is being used in a particular bag. With ACD or CPD, this shelf life is 21 days. With CPDA1, this shelf life is 35 days. And if we introduce sagum also along with the CPD, the shelf life of uh, RBC becomes 42 days. 
the blood we collect in a primary bag along with the primary bag uh, different satellite bags are attached now the number of satellite bags that depends upon how many components of which component we intend to prepare depending upon that these blood bags are single bag double bag triple and quadruple bags satellite bags these can be attached either from the top of the primary bag or the main bag or from the bottom of the primary bag so these are the pictures that i could get um, of the blood bags this is a triple uh, this is a bag we call it as a triple blood bag in this both the satellite bags they are attached from top of the main collecting bag this is a quadruple bag here the satellite bags this is the main bag in which we take the collection and these satellite bags these are these two are collected from the top and one is attached from the bottom of the uh, main primary uh, collecting bag blood as we know it is comprised of three components uh, cellular components and the plasma in the cell there are red blood cell white blood cells and the platelet red blood cells they constitute constitute about 44 to 45% of the total plasma constitutes 55% and less than 1% is of white blood cells and the platelets when we separate blood whole blood that we collect if when we separate we can uh, separate into either the cellular components or the components that contain only plasma the cellular components are packed red cells platelet concentrates single donor uh, apheresis platelets this apheresis is a uh, technique in which we collect only one component from the donor itself but at the time of uh, collection only we take only we take out the whole blood collect only intended product which is required for a particular patient and rest of the components they are uh, returned back to the donor's body the other cellular components component is granulocyte and buffy coat in the plasma derived component there is fresh frozen plasma cryo precipitate cryo poor plasma and the, so there can be single donor apheresis plasma coming to the methods of component preparation the components can be prepared either by the gravity separation or centrifugation the basic principle behind separation of whole blood into components is the different a specific gravity of different components of blood uh, as the red blood cells are heavier during centrifugation they come at the bottom of the bag while plasma being the lightest component it becomes as a superlative now in the first method the gravity separation method this is a old method very old and crude method but it is a cheap method and it does not require uh, many uh, elaborative and expensive Uh, equipment which are indeed required for the centrifugation process of component separation uh this can be this is still being used in the peripheral areas where these component uh, machines are not available here the blood which is collected is kept in hanging position overnight from 12 to 16 hours and after that plasma is expressed from top and is labeled as single donor plasma and stored in deep freezer at minus 40 degree and it can be used for a year while the remnant portion which is in the main bag that is prbc it is stored at 2 to 6 degrees by the centrifugation we use different speeds different time durations for which the whole blood is uh, spun in the refrigerated uh, centrifuge and the different speeds depending upon that we can give light spin to the whole blood or hard spin in the light spin they will uh, this is for the shorter time and at a lower speed like it can be around 2600 to 3000 rpm for 5 minutes and hard spin is at a higher speed for longer duration the various equipments which are required for uh, component preparation these are weighing balance to weigh to have the accurate weight of the blood bag that we have collected two pan balance which is needed for uh, balancing the two arms which will be there in the centrifuge refrigerated centrifuge for the centrifugation laminar air flow bench all the work of component separation is done in this then deep freezers to store uh, fresh frozen plasma as well as cryo precipitate platelet incubator for the storage of uh, platelets rdps 
cryobath, which is further required while preparing uh, cryoprecipitate from FFP, plasma expressor, or automated component extractor. This is required to separate the supernatant portion of centrifuge uh, whole blood from the remaining tube sealer and sterile connecting device. Now, this is a pectoral presentation of the protocol that we follow for uh, centrifugation of blood bags. This is the uh, bag which is collected at, along with the attached satellite bags. This is weight. The weight has to be exactly known. Now, this is, this is a uh, centrifuge bucket in which this blood bag is kept. It is properly packed and kept in this bucket. This is to be counterbalanced with the other bag. The weight of two bags which will be kept diagonally opposite in centrifuge machine has to be safe. Otherwise, there may be problem. There can be uh, leakage. There can be rupture of the bags while preparing components. This is the uh, refrigerated centrifuge. This is for the 12 bags. Uh, we can make components from this, uh, from 12 units at a time. The two, the one thing that I was saying that uh, the diagonally opposite bags, they should be of the same weight to avoid any imbalance during centrifugation. Now, after centrifuge, <clears throat> this is the manual expressor, which is used to take out the supernatant from two portion of tubings to the satellite bag. At our institute, we are using automatic uh, component separator in place of this uh, uh, manual expressor. This is a diagrammatic representation of component preparation using centrifugation. Whole blood, when it is centrifuged, when we give a light spin to the whole blood, the platelet-rich plasma that gets separated, that is expressed from the top uh, tubing to the satellite bag. After that, this additive solution, which is sagam, which is used in our uh, at our place, this is introduced into the remaining PRBCs, into the remaining red blood cells. This red blood cells are then sealed off, labeled properly, and uh, they are uh, stored at two to six degree. Now, coming to the PRP, which gets prepared, this PRP again, this PRP is centrifuged along with the remaining satellite bags at a heavy spin so that the platelets, they come at the bottom and the supernatant is plasma, which then gets separated. Platelets, these are stored at 22 to 24 degree with continuous agitation in the equipment termed as platelet incubator. Then this FFP, this can be stored at minus 80 degree immediately. If we need to prepare cryoprecipitate, this frozen FFP that is thawed, uh, and again centrifuge to uh, take out the plasma portion and to uh, cryoprecipitate remains behind in the bag. This method that I was explaining with the help of last diagram, that is the PRP method of preparing components. PRP stands for platelet-rich plasma. The other method is buffy coat method. In this buffy coat method, we can uh, use this buffy coat method only in top and bottom bags that I had shown previously. In this, the after the centrifugation, FFP is taken out. The remaining part is buffy coat and the red cells in the primary bag. From the uh, bottom attachment of the main bag, red cells are taken out in the other satellite bags. The buffy coat, it remains in the bag in which we took the collection. Now this, from this again, after hanging and centrifugation, platelets can be prepared or these buffy coats can be pooled to make the pooled platelets. Both the ways are there. Coming to the red blood cells, red blood cells, as I said, they are stored in two to six degree. Shelf life depends upon the uh, additive solution used. The metoprit of uh, red blood cells that varies from 60 to 65 to 75 percent. If we use a bag which is having additive solution, the hematocrit will be around 65%. While if it is not having any additive solution, then the hematocrit will be around 70 to 75%. Once this, the shelf life, although it is, it varies from 21 to 42 days, but once the unit is open, it has to be used within 24 hours. 
there are several modifications in the red blood cells, although it will be taken in detail in later. Uh, these modifications are leukoreduced RBC, pediatric helicots, RBCs, frozen RBCs, which are used uh, after deglycerolization, or saline washed RBCs and irradiated RBCs. The shelf life changes as per the modification. Leukoreduced RBC and pediatric RBC, they have the sh same shelf life. But irradiated RBCs, it is 28, for irradiated RBCs, it is 28 days or the actual expiry of the blood bag or the pediatric cell uh, of the red blood cells. Then frozen RBCs, the shelf life is 10 years. But once we wash them, once we, it, it has to be used within 24 hours. Uh, this diagram shows you uh, the motto why we do leukoreduction. reduction. Normally the whole blood or the bad blood cells, they have WBC in the range of two to three, Two, uh, 2.5 to 3 is to 10 raised to power 9, which is a very high count and it can cause many adverse effects or you can say uh, transfusion reactions. Once we do the leukoreduction, based on how much leukoreduction is achieved, the chances of transfusion reaction also decreases. Uh, the methods of leukoreduction, first one is the buffy port removal. The method that I have shown you for the component preparation in the buffy port removal, that causes reduction of WBC by one log reduction. The other method is the filters which are used, microaggregate filters or specific adsorption filter which are used for three log uh, reduction of the WBC. When we say one log, that means there is 10 times reduction of the WBC and three log means 1000 times reduction in the WBC count in the RBC uh, on the red blood cell. Uh, these are different type of leukodepletion filters, clot filters, which are not actually the leukocyte filters. They are simply the uh, filters for which, which are used for transfusion. Microaggregate filter, they bring about one log leukoreduction and adsorption filter. These filters, they, are, they bring about three log reduction. They work on the principle of sieving and adhesion. The WBCs which tend to pass through the filters, uh, they get sieved. First of all, the platelets which are present in the red cell black, they get adhered to the walls of fabric or the material of which that uh, filter is made. And upon that, WBC get adsorbed. That is how it causes reduction of the WBC up to 99%. This is the diagram how this leukoreduction is done. These are the bags which are containing TRBC along with the uh, filters. These are the filters. And the, all the aggregates and the WBC will get accumulated in this filter and the remaining TRBC will come into the bag. This causes 10 to 20% 20 20, uh, percent reduction in the hematocrit. The final unit which is ready for after leukodepletion, it must have a count less than 10 raised to power 6 WBCs as per uh, US FDA guidelines. The other modification is frozen RBCs, although it is done very uh, less commonly. It is mainly to increase the shelf life and is done in cases of very rare groups like Bombay blood group. Here the glycerol is added as a cryoprotectant uh, for the RBCs to prevent the lysis. Now, when we have to use these RBCs, these glycerolized and frozen RBCs, these need to be deglycerolized. For that, the RBCs are thawed at 37 degrees, and after that, they are washed to remove the glycerin. They can be washed either manually or can be done with the help of these uh, automatic processors. Now, these after deglycerolization, the RBCs uh, has, uh, need to be used within 24 hours as the system becomes open while watching it. Next one is the saline washed RBCs. These are used in patients who are uh, uh, allergic to the plasma proteins as there is some remaining amount of plasma within the RBCs. So if someone is allergic to those proteins, uh, to wash out such proteins, the saline washed RBCs are used. Again, it can be done by the manual method or the automated processes. But saline washed RBCs, they have limitation of very short life of 24 hours and large amount of red blood cell loss, hemolysis may occur and potassium le may, uh, levels may increase. And as it is an open system while doing the washing, there, is a, there are chances of microbial contamination. Next is the irradiated RBCs. Uh, blood products are irradiated to prevent the graft versus host disease. And this irradiation uh, can be done either using gamma irradiation or X-ray irradiators. 
trauma irradiation using cesium 137 or x-ray or in linear x-ray radiations the dose of radiation is 20, 25 to 50 gram Next is the packed red cell helicots. As uh, we are a pediatric institute, uh, we are using these packed red cell helicots, that is paddy bags, very commonly. There are the different methods which can be used to prepare these helicots are either use of pediatric blood bag collection systems like panta bags or quad bags. In such bags, the helicots can be prepared. The bags, there are in the panta bags, there are four satellite bags which are attached to the main bag. And directly the RBCs can be prepared in helicoptered in those bags. The other method is this uh, pediatric blood collection systems are less commonly used, but more commonly method is the helicoptering of the PRBC units, uh, where the uh, a transfer bag is attached to the PRBC unit using a sterile connecting device, and the desired amount of PRBCs are transferred to the smaller bags. We can give as small as 30, 40 ml of blood which are required in preterm babies or in uh, in uh, NICU patients. At our institute, we are doing uh, three equal alley codes of RBC if, if it is required. It gives a uniform volume of 80 to 100 ml from each PRBC unit, PRBC bag, and we are using the term paddy bags for this. <coughs> Coming to the next component, that is platelets. Platelet, as we know, they are required for the bleeding disorder yeah, patients. So could you just, uh, just, two minutes, just two minutes. We think, uh, for preparing platelet, we, we need to do uh, two spins. First is the soft spin by which we will get PRP or platelet rich plasma and followed by a heavy spin to express out the plasma from the as a supernatant and the platelet concentrate that remain behind in the bean bag. These are stored at 20-24 degree for five days with continuous agitation. And each unit should be able, should be having 5.5 into 10 raised to power 10 platelets. Different type, the platelet that I was describing till now are the random donor platelet. Beside this, there can be pooling of the random donor platelets or platelet paralysis. Pooling can be done as an open system or it can be done in the automated system in which it is a closed system. Platelet pheresis, this is an apheresis procedure to have a therapeutic dose, uh, adult dose from single donor. Uh, this is the apheresis machine and the apheresis procedure going on the random donor platelets and the single donor platelet. This has almost five to six times of the uh, volume of the random donor platelets. Next is the fresh frozen plasma. Uh, fresh frozen plasma is to be separated within eight hours. It is stored at minus 40 degree for one year. Uh, before issuing, it needs to be thawed at 30 to 37 degree. And after thawing, it can be stored at 1 to 6 degree up to 24 hours, uh, beyond which it is uh, not of any use. And once thawed, it should not be refrozen. Cryoprecipitate is prepared by thawing FFP. And storage conditions are same as that of uh, FFP. And it should also not be. Uh, Refrozen once thawed. It contains different clotting factors which may be required for the patients. Next is the granulocytes. Uh, our WBCs, there are different types lymph lymphocyte, monocyte, and the granulocyte. Granulocytes are in the abundance. These can be prepared by granulocytophoresis, just like platelet pheresis, there can be granulocytophoresis for which the patient needs pre preparation or the donor needs pre preparation in the form of uh, either steroid or GZSF or granulocytes can be used from the buffy coat. Neutrophils are most numerous cell which are present in the granulocyte and they are required. These, uh, this component is mainly required in the neutropenic patients who are uh, having either bacterial or fungal infections and are not responding to any sort of treatment. They are also used in, for, uh, as a supportive therapy in uh, hematomalignancy patients. The dose is 1 into 10 raised to power 10 for the adult patients and they are stored at 20 uh, at room temperature for 24 hours. They can be stored in platelet agitator without shaking those agitators. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Sanjay sir, we'll take questions at the end of the session. Is that okay? Yes, yes, I know. 
Now I would like to request uh, Professor D.K. Singh sir, Dr. to introduce the next speaker. The next speaker is, um, I'm just sharing the slide. The next speaker is uh, Dr. Sangeeta Pahuja. Over to you, sir. I'm <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank everybody from SSP uh, uh, PH Hospital for giving me this opportunity to talk on red cell transfusion triggers and modifications for pediatric use. So, uh, pediatrics is a very heterogeneous group. It, this includes neonates, preterm, term, hemoglobinopathy, PICU patients, etc. So, uh, for transfusion medicine purposes, uh, excuse me, ma'am. Am could I audible, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. But could you project your slides? That's in the. Okay. Are they not visible? I am. It shows that I am sharing my screen. It does. Could you do slideshow as well? Just a minute. Full screen. Full screen. Okay. Better, ma'am. Right. Thank you. So, uh, for practical purposes for transfusion medicine. Neonate is considered up to four months of age because the, uh, uh, the, uh, the blood grouping antibody screening procedures are different. Child is not a miniature adult because physiology and compensatory mechanisms are very different. So what are the benefits and risks of red cell transfusions in neonates? So one of the most important benefit is to optimize oxygen delivery. But is it always true? There are several uh, complications which are more seen in premature neonates. These include necrotizing enterocolitis, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, retinopathy of prematurity, long-term abnormal neurodevelopment, etc. So what happens when we give the adult donor blood to these premature neonates? We know that these uh, donor units have inflammatory substances. They cause oxidative stress and the neonates have immature gut. Added to this is the small bowel hypo hypoxia, which can contribute to necrotizing enterocolitis occurring in neonates. So whether anemia is the cause or the red cell transfusion is the cause of necrotizing enterocolitis, it's not very clear. Moreover, one very important significant thing is that the uh, preterm neonates, they have hemoglobin F and we are transfusing them with hemoglobin A in the donor unit. This has lower oxygen affinity and it releases more of oxygen. This 
high oxygen milieu is creates free oxygen radicals which is uh, which causes more of endothelial injury and inflammatory response also increased iron free hemoglobin which absorbs nitric oxide all these are the causes of inflammatory response so taco and trali are more commonly underdiagnosed and underreported in neonates so there are also long term neurodevelopmental abnormalities which have been reported but we don't know whether restrictive or liberal transfusions actually cause these abnormalities so there have been several trials in low birth weight in um, infants so bell et al pint et al etc these are all the trials which have given very contradictory results on uh, restrictive versus liberal transfusion policies so systematic review and meta analysis on liberal and restrictive transfusions said that restrictive transfusion practices in low birth weight in preterm neonates were not inferior as compared to liberal transfusion practices and they did not find any difference in regard to mortality or neonatal complications so there is a recently concluded etno trial which also said that liberal and restrict restrictive transfusion policies they had the similar impact <clears throat> coming to the pediatric transfusions again there was a uh, tripico study by lecroix et al they said that restrictive transfusion practice was associated with reduced blood use and it was non inferior there was no significant increase in adverse outcomes and also in the subgroups of sepsis non cardiac surgery respiratory dysfunction they advocated restrictive use of blood so what is the red cell transfusion trigger optimal red cell transfusion trigger is the one which should avoid delay transfusion it should avoid unnecessary or premature transfusions it should be determined continuously and should have a high sensitivity and specificity so uh, this was a taxi initiative transfusion in anemia expert initiative so this was undertaken by around 42 internationally uh, experts they reviewed all the uh, guidelines and recommendations and rcts which were there and they gave evidence based guidelines as well as consensus based recommendations so these are very helpful in deciding when to transfuse our children so these recommendations suggest adoption of broad based restrictive rbc transfusion approach they also suggest principles of patient blood management should be uh, advocated so coming to neonatal red cell transfusions we know that the uh, hemoglobin of every new uh, new uh, newborn term or preterm decreases in 6 to up to 6 to 12th week of life so all these guidelines on transfusion of neonates depend upon the gestational age at birth postnatal age respiratory support congenital heart diseases etc and other clinical features so there are several guidelines uh, the most of the transfusions in in neonates are small volume top up transfusions to replace phlebotomy losses in the context of anemia of prematurity so these are traditionally given at uh, 10 to 20 ml per kg typically 15 ml per kg over 4 hours so these are the several uh, guidelines which have been given for neonatal transfusions so this is the bcsh guidelines for preterm neonates which have divided these uh, patient, uh, these children into ventilated group on oxygen support and off oxygen support so for term infants decision should be based on the clinical status and stable term infants not on cardio respiratory support and no supplemental oxygen should not need blood unless the hemoglobin is below 7 g percent in pre operative infants with uncorrected cyanotic congenital heart disease taxi recommends rbc transfusions to maintain hemoglobin between 7 to 9 g percent next is the transfusions of large volumes into in neonates that will happen in their surgical situations so whenever we are giving large volume neonatal and infantile transfusions it should be the blood should be fresh preferably day 5 to day 7 all large volume transfusions should be given by a blood bombers so for ecmo also there is not enough evidence and it should be based on the clinical justification so coming to transfusions to infants and children above 4 months of age so these groups are generally hemat hemato oncology patients pico cardiac surgery patients ecmo patients so like neonates the volume of red cells transfused should be minimized for this group also so this is a very good table which has been given by the taxi initiative 
they say whenever the hemoglobin is less than 5 gram percent transfuse rbcs if hemoglobin is more than 7 gram percent then in hemodynamically stable in all these conditions there is no requirement of red cell transfusions but the we need to consider a higher threshold in acute brain injury oncologic diagnosis it's um, and for hemoglobins between 5 to 7 gram percent the clinical judgment is required to decide whether transfusion is required or not then they have also given for the several cardiac diseases what what is the uh, threshold which needs to be reached for uh, stem cell transplant or oncology patients there is no specific evidence to guide the optimum hemoglobin transfusion threshold although current practice suggests that threshold between 7 to 8 gram percent is reasonable then chronic anemia patients due to red cell aplasia or bone marrow failures they may require hemoglobin thresholds of 8 or more then surgical patients now what is important is that in a surgical patient who stable without major comorbidity or bleeding we can keep the transfusion threshold of 7 gram percent but more important than that is pre operative hemoglobin should be optimized by treating iron deficiency anemia prenexamic acid should be considered red cell salvage procedures should be considered in all children at risk of significant bleed so then there are also guidelines which have been given for the cardiac surgery i won't be going into the details so very important part of transfusion management of these patients is patient blood management so apart from giving transfusions it is very important that we look at how to manage the anemia in these patients minimize phlebotomy losses particularly in neonates and preterm neonates by use of low volume blood collection technologies non invasive monitoring for parameters like oxygen saturation near patient or point of care testing use of cord blood sample for neonatal testing use of maternal sample for antibody screening in neonates then delayed cord clamping this is very very important that cord clamping should be delayed by at least 1 minute or till the cord stops to pulsate this increases the hematocrit and decreases the Uh, iron deficiency anemia for long time in neonates then optimization of surgical and anesthetic techniques all these go a long way in managing these ch children now what is the optimal storage time we all know uh, we tend to feel that we should give fresh blood to neonates but this is not always true so in vitro changes occur in red cell units this involves biochemical metabolic and mechanical changes so <clears throat> we know that the older units they have more potassium levels less of 23d dpg levels so there was this trial which was conducted in canada erip trial wherein in one limb they gave the fresh blood to the patients and in another one they gave the blood up to 42 days to these patients so they saw that there was no difference in mortality or composite outcomes in both these groups so it is safe to give the uh, blood up to 42 days storage time to neonates in top up transfusions so evidence available and existing guidelines do not recommend routine use of fresh rbc units for top up or small volume transfusions but specific clinical situations which warrant the use of rbcs with shorter storage time these include intrauterine transfusions large volume transfusions exchange transfusions cardiac surgeries and use of irradiated blood products next important concept in pediatric transfusion practices to minimize donor exposure by use of pd packs and aliquoting dr seema dua has already talked about it so i won't go into the details but the main uh, focus of reducing the donor um, ex, uh, by, of aliquoting is that we can give blood from the same bag that is a dedicated unit to one patient for 42 days and it will not harm the baby so we should have our own algorithm of how we will um, uh, uh, allocate these pd packs so this is the um, a template of bcsh um, pd pack al allocation algorithm so important benefit of pd packs is that it uh, reduces the donor exposure then another important concern in pediatric uh, population is red cell additive solution we know that additive solutions um, at as13 sagam etc they contain adenine and mannitol adenine can cause renal toxicity and mannitol is a potent diuretic and it can cause fluctuations in cerebral blood flow of preterm infants so 
it has been now seen that in small volume transfusions, these additives are safe. However, safety of additive prepared, additive solution prepared RBCs in trauma related massive transfusions, ECMO, cardiac surgery or exchange transfusions has not been studied. So in US, still many large volume transfusions um, are, are done in RBC suspended in additive solutions. But the BCSH strongly says that red cells for intrauterine and neonatal exchange transfusion should be suspended in CPD and not in the additive solution. So for our, our purposes, since all the bags which offer us pre-storage leukoreduction have additive solution, we can remove the additive solution and then we can replace it with the uh, uh, compatible plasma. Next important concern is that what volume should be transfused to these patients. So there is a very simple formula that is the patient weight into the, the blood volume of the patient into the hemoglobin increment divided by the hemoglobin of the donor unit. So this, amount, uh, this converts to 10 to 15 ml per kg of blood transfused. This will increase the hemoglobin by 3 gram percent if it is without additive or by 2 gram percent if it is in the additive solution. So the usual volume administered is 10 to 20 ml per kg per transfusion. Now, what is very important is that all the prescriptions for blood transfusions should be in milliliters and not in units. So this is a very, very important recommendation. Otherwise, this leads to either excess transfusions, under transfusions or wastage of blood. Then next is the concept of irradiated blood. Irradiation uh, damages T lymphocytes so that they cannot cause graft versus host disease. They cannot engraft in the recipient. So in neonates, we use irradiated blood in intrauterine transfusions. In a neonate who has received IUT up to six months after the expected date of delivery, also for exchange transfusions and very low birth weight infants up to four months of age. French experts say that the preterm newborns less than 32 weeks gestation age, we should use irradiated RBCs. And all the babies, if they are weighing less than 1500 grams, we should use irradiated RBCs. Then another important group is all the, uh, all the neonates who have confirmed immune deficiency. So either congenital immune deficiency or a complex cardiac abnormality, which might be associated with immunodeficiency like Dijot syndrome. Now, what is the problem if we irradiate the units? This leads to a leakage of large amount of potassium. So, the, um, so this, leads, this can cause hyperkalemia. So in such situations, like in intrauterine transfusions or exchange transfusions, irradiated units should be used within 24 hours. Next is use of CMV negative blood. So uh, CMV negative blood is suggested for intrauterine transfusions, exchange transfusions, and for neonates up to 28 days post expected date of delivery. So once the baby is four weeks of age, there is no requirement of CMV negativity after four weeks of age. Now coming to um, the exchange transfusions, exchanges, blood transfusion is performed to manage high or rapidly rising bilirubin more commonly in the settings of hemolytic disease of newborn. So how do we do and which components do we go, uh, give for exchange transfusion? So the component for exchange transfusion should be compatible with both mother and the baby and it should be negative for the antigen which the mother against which the mother has an antibody. So usually it is group O negative RB uh, red cells suspended in ABO compatible plasma. So the, day, the red cells should be less than five to seven days old. Hematocrit is 45 to 60% of the unit. So when we are using additive, we may remove additive contain and add plasma against it. So the unit should be irrad irradiated unless it is causing very uh, lo lots of delay. And the shelf life is 24 hours post irradiation. The unit should be negative for hemoglobin S it should have CMV reduced risk, that is either leukocyte reduced or CMV zero negative. The transfusion volume is typically 160 ml per kg, that is a double volume exchange transfusion. Then how do we do testing, pre-transfusion testing for neonates less than six months of age? Now, this is important that for all the children with less than six, four months of age, sample of both mother and infant should be obtained for initial group determination. An antibody screen should preferably be done on the mother. Because in neonatal sample, once the antibody has bound to the red cells, we may even miss 
that the baby's plasma has antibodies. Secondly, we don't want to bleed, uh, to do lots of lobotomy procedures in neonates. We don't want to bleed the neonate. So we will take the sample from the mother. So if maternal sample is unavail available, then try to get the history of the blood group and antibody screen and the transfusion history of mother and the baby, including IUT's history. So when we get the mother sample, we do ABOD grouping, we do antibody screening, and if there is antibody, then we do antibody identification. On the baby sample, we do ABO and D forward grouping alone because the baby has not produced any antibodies. Any ABO antibodies are also not present in the baby. So uh, DAT is not routinely performed in all neonates. It is performed only when there is a suspicion of hemolysis or hemolytic disease of newborn or when the mother has clinically significant antibodies. If the maternal uh, sample, plasma sample or serum sample is not available, then we can do antibody screen from patient sample. So if the ABO and D groups are identified, there is no anomaly, no antibody screening, then no free, free transfusion further testing is required for till four months of age. If atypical antibodies are present, then we will follow it up as per the, um, as we do in the cases of hemolytic disease of newborn. Whenever we select red cells for neonatal transfusions till four months of age, then it should be always, always compatible with the mother and neonate. Even if the, D, the DAT of neonate is negative, this is very important. We think that if only the DAT is negative, then it should be compatible with mother. Say if the mother, if the baby is blood group O A and the mother is blood group then anti-A of the mother can react with the transfused red cells and can cause hemolysis in the baby. So it should always be compatible with both mother and the baby. So most, more commonly, O-negative red cells are used for top-up or exchange transfusions. If we can provide group identical units for transfusions in infants, it is good, but then we should keep on, we should stick to the same group with which we have for each subsequent transfusion. Minimize donor exposure by use of PD packs. So once we have given one uh, aliquot from one bag, then we do not need to do further cross match for the neonatal sample each time when we will give the bag, uh, when we will give an, uh, the further aliquot from the same bag. If we are changing the bag, then we need to do the cross match again. If the aliquots are being prepared from the same bag, then we do not need to do the repeat cross matches. Then pre-transfusion testing in infants um, from four months above, this is similar to the testing which is done in adults. Now, one important point here is that children who are on chronic transfusion program, including sickle cell disease, thalassemias, et cetera, we should do their extended red cell phenotyping at this outset that is prior to transfusion. So whenever it is a very good practice to give them phenotype matched blood to prevent or to reduce the risk of alloimmunization for in these children. So, uh, I would like to summarize um, uh, my talk by saying that if we have a blood transfusion policy in the hospital and a method of ensuring its implementation, it has an impact in reducing the number of red cell transfusions. When deciding to transfuse a critically ill child, not only the hemoglobin, but overall clinical context, risks, benefits, and alternatives to transfusions should be considered. In critically ill child, the hemoglobin should be measured um, should be measured before prescribing the red cell transfusion. Restrictive transfusion approach should be adopted and patient blood management strategy should be adopted as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you for your patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Sangeeta, for a very excellent talk. We will have discussion and question answer after the last session of the third speaker. Uh, so I will invite uh, for the next session, Dr. Hari Krishna Dhawan, he will speak on cryoplasma and granulocyte transfusion triggers and uh, uh, triggers and indications. So, Dr. H K Dhawan is working as associate professor, Department of Transfer Medicine at PGI Chandigarh. MD Transfer Medicine from PGI Chandigarh itself in 2007. His PG Fellowship Award at ISBTI Ahmedabad in 2006, bronze medal for research work published by resident in Vijay Chandigarh 2008, Harold Gunson Fellowship Award at International Society of Blood Transfusion 
टाइप टू हंड्रेड इलेवन टू फेलोशिप अबाउट हम इंटरनेशनल प्लाज्मा फ्रैक्शनेशन एसोसिएशन एट योग्यकर्ता इंडोनेशिया मार्च 2017 एंड इज एरिया ऑफ इंटरेस्ट आर क्वालिटी एश्योरेंस इन ब्लड कंपोनेंट्स एंड क्लिनिकल ट्रांसफ्यूजन मेडिसिन इनवाइट डॉक्टर एच के धवन सर thank you sir um, for the kind in, uh, introduction um, Is my screen visible, sir? Am I audible? Yes, visible, visible. Okay, so uh, we'll be discussing uh, the platelet, plasma, cryo, granulocyte, their indication figures for pediatric use. So, uh, so we'll be covering these four components: platelet, FT, cryo, and granulocytes. So, uh, these are the uh, guidelines. Uh, guidelines on transfusion of fetus and neonates in older children so by bcsh so the bcsh uh, usually gives a uh, grade on the recommendation uh, to the uh, any guideline uh, they are giving so uh, i just want to highlight this first that the quality of evidence uh, is graded as a b c and d which is a is when randomized control trial is available on some Uh, topic uh, if observation studies are there then it's c if any other evidence is there it's d uh, maybe uh, the uh, rct is uh, uh, some limitations it is i think graded as b so the recommendations they are give as strong which is grade 1 or weak so grade 1 is uh, where the uh, benefit clearly overweighs the risk and they use the term recommended and in weak grade there is a appreciable uncertainty still exists so they say it has suggested or consider so these will be used uh, during my slide so i just wanted to highlight at the upfront so uh, first component uh, will be discussing is platelet concentrate uh, as already uh, been discussed or the preparations done i will discuss about the salient uh, specifications that this can be prepared both by whole blood called rdp and by frs is called sdap commonly the volume is 70 ml for rdp and 200 ml for sdap the shelf life is 5 days at 22 degrees so the important point is that platelet concentrates uh, from rdps have around 55 ml platelets uh, but the sdaps have uh, the standard dose is 300 ml platelets so the volume is three times but platelet content is around six times Uh, as a mean, uh, so this is the product. So uh, while selection of the product, we uh, need to uh, consider these, and these can be converted into paddy bags. Especially the SDPs can be divided into smaller paddy bags using strike melting device, and specific dose can be given to a neonate or a, a bigger children. So the dose is 10 to 15 ml per kg uh, for a pediatric population. It is Uh, generally considered for rdp as one rdp per 10 kg and this increases the platelet count in neonates by around 50000 to 1 lakh and uh, similarly for the children so platelet transfusion in neonates so the uh, so as uh, although the uh, 50000 per microliter is considered as severe uh, uh, thrombocytopenia in neonates but uh, 25000 is considered as cut off for neonates with no bleeding including uh, the near patients with no bleeding in, and no family history of rch and 50000 is considered for neonates with bleeding current coagulopathy before surgery and uh, in near patients where the, the sibling had the is rch and 1 uh, lakh is considered as trigger point for platelet transfusion in neonates Where the major surgery, uh, major bleeding is there, or there is a uh, neo surgery or eye surgery, some uh, 
sensitive part surgery is there. But the uh, as uh, we do not have uh, RCTs uh, on these uh, uh, conditions, so the grade is to C uh, for these uh, recommendations. So most of the platelet transfusion uh, in in units is prophylactic uh, platelet transfusions. So in extremely preterm infants, uh, the trigger point should be uh, uh, below fifty thousand per microliter and first week of life. In ill appearing infants also, uh, uh, we should increase the trigger point from 25,000 to 50,000. And 50,000 should be the trigger point for platelet transfusion. In neonates receiving drugs that causes platelet dysfunction like endomethacine, ibuprofen, and patient with DIC. And, uh, platelet transfusions are not given on the basis of only on the low platelet count alone, we should consider the uh, underlying diseases also. So ITP, HIT, TTP, HUS. So these are the conditions where platelet transfusion can exacerbate the thrombosis. So, so the platelet transfusion should be given in the diseases only when uh, there is a life-threatening need. So platelet transfusion in bigger children. So the there are lack of studies on uh, this population also regarding uh, this so mainly they have taken the uh, uh, guidelines from the adult literature so the grade is two in this also so here they have kept the uh, later transient figure to be 10,000 for non-bleeding patients and for uh, itp ttp hus uh, with the life threatening bleed only. For uh, other uh, minor bleeds, the plated, uh, uh, the plated transfusion trigger is considered as 20,000 plated count. And uh, for insertion of non tunneled central venous catheter, for lumbar puncture, they consider it should, should be uh, below 40,000. But if uh, there are other uh, abnormalities or uh, sepsis there, then we should go for. Uh, 50,000 as the cutoff for data uh, transfusion and GI bleed and other DIC, all these have a cutoff of 50,000. And in major hemorrhage and post cardiac surgery and uh, surgery of critical sites, as I told in neonates, also central venous uh, system and eye. So the cutoff is below 75 to 1 lakh. So it is suggested that most stable uh, children. Prophylactic platelet transfusion should be administered when the platelet count is below 10,000. So they tolerate up to 10,000. So uh, for uh, as earlier uh, told that ITP, TTP, HUS only to be transfused if there is a life threatening grade and the grade here is 2B. So RCT is available, but uh, they are not very conclusive. So coming to fresh frozen plasma. So Specification of the product. So, uh, this can uh, be prepared from both from whole blood and pharesis. Mostly in our country, we prepare it from whole blood only. So, volume is around 200 ml, but we can have ready packs if uh, there is setup. Shelf life is one year. This contains around one international per ml of all clotting factors, and dose is 15 to 20 ml per kg. So, the very important point is that INR of FFP ranges from 1.1 to 1.3. So, uh, so the correction in the INR, which is the most common indication used for FFP, uh, says that one unit of FFP will not cause much change in the INR if the uh, pre-transfer INR is 1 to 1.5, and even if even 1.6 to 1.8, there is very minor correction. So it, so FFP transfusion for minor correction should not be used for minor uh, coagulation abnormalities. And only the effect of uh, correction occurs when the INR pre transfusion INR is high. So there is considerable uncertainty about the appropriate use of FFP. And uh, this is mainly misused in neonates and in children. Um, prophylactic use of FFP, including prior to surgery, is of unproven benefit. And in older children uh, and adults, we have 
this PT, APTT greater than 1.5 as definition for adrenaline coagulogram, but uh, this is very difficult to apply in neonates, especially preterm neonates, uh, uh, given that the ranges may be uncertain uh, in this age group. So, a policy of routine coagulation screen uh, is inappropriate in uh, neonates, and uh, this only leads to increased transfusion of FFP without benefit in this group. So, recommendation for neonates there is no evidence to support the routine use of FFP uh, uh, to correct abnormalities of coagulation screen alone without a bleed. So the grade here is 1C. So it is strongly recommended and uh, there are uh, observation studies regarding this. So FFP may be of benefit in neonates with clinically significant bleeding uh, prior to invasive procedure uh, where there is a uh, significant prolongation of the uh, uh, PT, APTT, um, uh, but we need to uh, prolongation according to the gestational and postnatal age reference ranges. So the recommendation is to see in this and FFP should not be used for simple volume replacement, which is uh, usually used in neonates and uh, it does not help to uh, uh, prevent in the prevention of uh, interventricular hemorrhage. So the uh, recommendation here also is very strong. It is one B here. So there is a condition called purpura fulminans, which is secondary to uh, homozygous deficiency of protein C and protein S in neonates. So FFP is appropriate for early management uh, in this, but if protein C concentrates are available, then they, they should be used. And FFP should be used for management of severe hereditary protein S deficiency uh, if it is there in the neonate. And coming to the cryoprecipitates, so uh, as already uh, explained, uh, the methods of preparation and everything. So this contains fibrinogen factor 8, von Willebrand factor, and factor 13. So this is mainly used for fibrinogen uh, these days. And um, guidelines uh, recommend transfer of cryoprecipitate if patient has a fibrinogen levels below uh, 100 milligram uh, per deciliter and overall management of low fibrinogen is same in neonates as in older children cryoprecipitates may also be indicated in neonatal cardiac surgery and in major hemorrhage so in cardiac surgery and major hemorrhage uh, we can use uh, cryoprecipitates in vitamin k deficiency bleeding uh, four factor prothrombin complex concentrates are preferable over ffp uh, uh, although there is a little published data on this vitamin k is recommended for every newborn infant and bleeding may occur after misprophylaxis. So it is it should be given to all infants because uh, this is a common cause of bleeding uh, in, uh, in this patient group. So in older children, uh, correction of uh, minor acquired coagulation abnormalities in non bleeding patients uh, regarding FFP and cryo. So the recommendations say that prophylactic FFP should not be enlisted to non bleeding patients uh, with minor uh, PT and APTT. Uh, although, uh, if there is a uh, major surgery, uh, this can be considered. So, prophylactic cryoprecipitate transfusion should also be, uh, should also, should not be done uh, only on the basis of fibrinogen degrees. And, but if there is a surgery planned and the fibrinogen is low, we can consider prophylactic cryoprecipitate transfusion. And it should be considered only when it is less than one gram uh, per liter for uh, before the surgery of the critical sites. So in DIC, FFP may be uh, beneficial in children with DIC who have significant coagulopathy uh, where the uh, it is more than 1.5 associated with clinically significant bleed uh, prior or prior to invasive procedures. Cryoprecipitates as uh, as a standard should be given when fibrinogen is uh, less than one gram per dl despite ffp so uh, we have to use ffp first and if the fibrinogen is not improving and there is ongoing bleed we can add cryo if the fibrinogen is consistently lower than uh, one gram per liter two minutes more dr Dhawan. so 
FFP uh, and cryotransfusion in liver uh, diseases. Uh, so in liver diseases, diseases, so there is a hemostatic uh, system reset. So which is accompanying with reduction natural anticoagulants also. So it should not be uh, uh, taken the only the coagulation screen should not be uh, uh, taken only into the concentration while deciding this. So liver disease, the standard coagulation test may be misleading. So uh, they should not be only taken as a trigger to transfusion. So in warfarin anticoagulant reversal, uh, so FFP can be used in emergency, but uh, prothrombin complex concentrates can definitely be of help in this. And recommendation is that FFP should not be used in urgent warfarin uh, reversal unless P uh, PCCs are not available. In TTPs, urgent plasma exchanges with FFP is indicated, and uh, FFP infusion can be given in congenital TTP. So in inherited uh, coagulation uh, disorders like hemophilia, specific factor concentrate should be given, but only the factor five uh, deficiency where the uh, specific factor is not available, we can use FFP. Factor 11 deficiency, we can use FFP because uh, factor 11 concentrates can be uh, pose a risk of prothrombosis. So FFP should not be used in the management of uh, inherited factor deficiency. And cryo should not be used uh, in, only in hyperfibrinemia. Uh, fibrinogen concentrates are available for this purpose. So the final component is granulocyte concentrate. So they can be prepared uh, both from pharesis and old guard. And, and the granulocyte content of this is one in 10 per 10 per bag. So they must be irradiated before uh, transfusion. So uh, so they are more mainly used in cancer-related neutropenia where the patient is not responding to antibiotics, but there is insufficient evidence to recommend the routine use of granulocytes in neonates. And granulocyte transfusion may be considered for the treatment of refractory infection in children. So the evidence is to see in this. So we need to do a pre-medication before this because they can pose uh, uh, transfusion reactions and they should never be uh, leukoid reduced, bedside leukoid reduced, because we want the granulocyte to be transfused. So the important uh, takeaway uh, from the uh, the guideline is that why we need to use these guidelines is that the all these uh, blood components are tested for TTIs. They are uh, not guaranteedly negative. So so the window period concept, the window period. Uh, is still existing even with the best of best uh, test available for, uh, for HIV, even with ID NAT, it is 4.7 4 days, HCV is 2.2 days, and HV is 14.9 days. So we must stick to the guidelines and uh, do a rational use of blood so that we can avoid the serious reaction in this uh, sensitive population. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dhawan. Excellent presentation by all the speakers, Dr. Dua, Dr. Sangeeta, Dr. Dhawan, on almost every aspect of blood component therapy. So now the house is open for question answer session. Uh, one question from Dr. Sandeep Nigam that uh, is, uh, I think, for Dr. Hari, uh, Dr. H.K. Dhawan only, uh, that uh, should be use the same pump for transfusion of plasma uh, of platelets as the uh, whole blood. And second thing, uh, part second part of the question is, should we keep shaking the platelet container? So uh, we can use, uh, the, uh, if we have used the whole blood uh, filter for the whole blood, we usually should change the uh, filter, uh, 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 the transfusion uh, set before each uh, component transfusion. So platelets uh, usually they uh, get entrapped in the uh, filter after uh, uh, it is used for long for the whole blood. And uh, the second question uh, was, sir? Should we keep it shaking uh, to so avoid no clumping of platelets? There is no need of shaking. Uh, uh, so this shaking is basically for the blood bank. Uh, for the, uh, on the uh, over longer period, these bladed can stick to the bag. But uh, before transfusion, you, you need not to shake the platelets. You can. Uh, hand the 
There is a request from uh, uh, Eco Spark to share your feedbacks on their site, Eco Spark, yes. and your comments, Dr. D.K. Singh, sir. Yeah, yeah there is one more question uh, from Dr. Nigam only. How to choose blood group for platelet transfusion or FFP transfusion in neonates? Uh, I think uh, Dr. Sangeeta. Uh, Dr. Dhawan, can you please answer? How to choose blood group of platelet transfusion or flesh present plasma transfusion in newborn babies? So for newborns, uh, we usually use uh, compatible, uh, EBU compatible plasma, EBU specific plasma and platelet components only. Uh, we, we rarely use uh, across the group, but they must be ABU compatible. So we can use AB plasma in all new units. Even if uh, the specific group platelets are not available, we can use uh, AB platelets, but uh, specifically ABO and RH, we match for new units and give. So for adults, we can give across the group also uh, for platelets, but for new units, Needle group, we usually give ABORS mass platelets and ABO compatible plasma. Okay, thank you. And just one comment uh, since most of the audience must be pediatricians, uh, whenever a newborn is uh, referred to uh, some other place for uh, NICU care or some surgical condition for a major surgery, we should always try to refer the mother if possible. And if it is not possible for mother to be referred, so at least uh, mother's blood sample should be sent along with the newborn baby. This uh, facilitates the care of a newborn baby at the higher center. Otherwise, it's very difficult to uh, get the mother's blood group or mother's sample, especially the reference from far off places. And uh, it definitely delays the treatment of uh, major surgical condition or uh, when your baby requires blood transfusion. So as far as possible, you should try to refer the mother. If it is not possible, then at least we should set the sample of mother properly labeled along with the new one baby. So that will help a lot of, uh, whenever the baby is into some bad symptoms or sensible or medical treatment. And Dr. Narendra, any comments? Yeah, so we can move on to this session. Dr. Nika. Yes, uh, Dr. Yeah. Dr. Singh here, he can get up the session and go to Dr. Anita for the next session. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairpersons, for, uh, for hosting the first session of our today's academic activity. Now, as we move ahead, uh, we have our second session, uh, which is majorly the panel discussion. So our Chairpersons for panel discussion is uh, Dr. Pandey. He is uh, a graduate from uh, MLN Medical College, Prayagraj, and has done his MD from Jhansi. Uh, he is a consultant pediatrician at the uh, Kilani Mother and Child Care Center in Priyagraj and is presently the president of IAP Allahabad branch. He has various uh, executive posts in Allahabad Medical Association and is currently serving as association as secretary of finance. Thank you for accepting, sir, our invitation and uh, finding time to be here as the chair. The next uh, chairperson is... Uh, is uh, Dr. Mukesh Kumawat. He is MD, MCH. MSMCH from uh, CTVS from uh, All India Institute of Medical Science in Delhi. He is presently additional professor and head in pediatric cardiac surgery at our institute. Previously to our institute, he has been serving at Ames Bhubaneswar and BHU Varanasi. So thank you, Dr. Mukesh, for accepting our invitation. We request the chairpersons to kindly introduce the panelists and take the proceeding further. Thank you. I request Dr. Yuginda to introduce Dr. Ruchi Rai and Dr. Siddharth. Sir, kindly unmute yourself. Thank you, Dr. Satyam, for giving me my introduction. And I'm thankful to all the organizers of the CME. And I'm, I've got privilege to introduce the Dr. Ruchi Rai, she, is, she, she was formerly the head in the Department of Pediatrics at MLN Med College, Jalabad, which is my alma mater also. And she established in level three, an ICU at uh, MLN Med College, Jalabad. And she has published more than 40 papers in the index journals. And she has authored numerous papers in the books. Currently, she is professor and head department of neurotology at Super Specialty Pediatric Hospital and Postgraduate Teaching Institute, Nevada. And 
I have got privilege of working with him, with her when she was working was in Allahabad, and the he the city was obliged to him. With this, she took care of the pediatric patients of Allahabad very nicely. And uh, the another panelist is Dr. Siddharth Tutadri. She is he has completed his DM pediatric hematology oncology from PGI MER Chandigarh in 2015. And currently, he is associate professor in the pediatric hematology oncology unit of the CMC Vellore. So I welcome both of you. And or now to Dr. Mukesh Kumawat to introduce other panelists. I would request to introduce. A very good afternoon to all the panelists and other other attendees who has made this. Uh, webinar successful and I shall welcome Mukesh Kumar and uh, I'm going to introduce the remaining two panelists for you are unmute you are muted sir please unmute yourself Dr. Satyam am I audible now hello yes am now yes yes okay so i am very privileged to introduce uh, the other two panelists the third panelist is dr satyam arora he is currently working as associate professor in department of transfusion medicine at the super specialty pediatric hospital and post graduate teaching institute which is situated in noida he has done his md in transfusion medicine from pgi chandigarh and after that he has completed 3 years senior residency from rml hospital delhi He also worked as observer to the Department of Hematology and Oncology and Bone Marrow Transplant at Tosic Cancer Center, Cleveland Clinic, USA. That was in 2015, and he has also been awarded with Dr. Harold Johnson Fellowship by ASBT at Mexico in 2012. He is member to Technical Review Committee for Hemovigilance Program of India. He is also chairperson and South uh, Southeast Asia representative for Young Professional Council of ASBT. And he is member of manuscript review panel at IJH BT, AJTS, and JIPH. And he has more than thirty two publications, and uh, most of them are. So I welcome Dr. Satya Marwada, and uh, our next panelist. Uh, again, uh, our next panelist is from my institute only, Dr. Radha Krishnan. Uh, she is working currently as associate professor in department of pediatric hematology and also heading the department at sspch pt in noida and her special interest in uh, coagulation disorders primary immunodeficiency pediatric cancer in developing countries so i welcome dr neeta thank you sir. Uh, thank you now do you want to thank you sir so i think we'll start with the panel discussion so we're running a little short of time we'll try to make it up here and uh, so the topics so we heard from all the speakers till now regarding the transfusion guidelines what is the evidence now let us try and put it in practice when we are actually faced with a child who um, who is uh, requiring transfusion so how do you choose a product and what are the factors that you keep in mind this is what we'll be dealing in the next four cases i welcome all the panelists to the session so um, like it was introduced earlier this is a product which is equivalent to drugs iv fluids or supportive care so equal importance as to when to request for it and how to use it that has to be there and that has to be uh, part of every uh, that's something that all post graduates in this field should be knowing and judicious transfusion practices are very very necessary because we know today that there are medical legal implications for decisions that we make today and like i even recently newspapers also you would have seen like 20 years later 30 years later somebody develops a transfusion infections then the whole um, the data of uh, the original case sheet where the request was made where whether it was indicated all these comes into purview so that is why every practice of ours should be evidence based so we discuss the first case which is uh, trans all the concerns of transfusing a neonate lot of it has been discussed so i request the panelists to be very brief and to the point sharing practical experiences 
so we have a 30 28 weaker preterm fourth day of life very very common scenario this is a first child non consanguineous marriage mother is 23 years she is o positive and uh, her first two trimesters were uneventful but uh, in third trimester she has had uh, 18 hours rupture of membranes baby cried at birth baby weight was 1 kilo blood group of the baby is a positive feed was initiated on day 2 septic screen was positive so antibiotics were started now on day 3 the baby is found to be ectric with abdominal distension baby is not tolerating feeds at that time the reports which were sent out have come like this um uh, the baby, hemoglobin is 15.6 wbc count of 12100 and a platelet count of 24000 bilirubin is 18 direct is 1.3 with a crp which is positive so i nahi is it kar le the way it's the data ha so i would discuss um, dr ruchi rai to request dr ruchi rai to kindly discuss regarding when would you advise so this is a baby preterm sick baby who's uh, weighing 1 kilo and has a platelet count of 24000 28 week when would you advise platelet transfusion in neonates so uh, thank you dr neeta so this is a very common scenario also pediatricians are uh, uh, advising to practice So this baby is a very low birth weight baby with a platelet count of twenty four thousand. So when we talk about uh, platelet transfusion guidelines, uh, we have uh, we normally follow the British guidelines which are uh, available on our screens. So we can see that any baby less than twenty five, uh, any baby who has a platelet count less than twenty five thousand, uh, will need a platelet transfusion. So this baby very well fits into this category. Also, the baby is not bleeding. So We will like to transfuse the uh, platelet in this uh, baby right here. So we will like to transfuse uh, platelets at ten ten uh, ml per kg for this child, and uh, we must understand that all these guidelines which are there and whatever uh, guidelines we are uh, coming up uh, every day, they are stressing more and more of uh, restrictive uh, strategies, less of management, more of observation, but very very close observation. so we must remember if we are planning not to transfuse then it is more important that we keep monitoring so for this baby definitely this baby is a candidate for platelet transfusion and uh, you can see it on the screen i have read, read out and i think previous speakers have also highlighted these uh, guidelines but one thing important is that these guidelines are just to guide they are no rules so you may have to uh, tweak these guidelines a little like suppose you are about to refer a baby who a baby wants to go to another hospital or you want to refer a baby to another hospital you may like to transfuse the baby even if the platelets are 30000 and even if that child is not bleeding and the baby has to travel some distance so uh, it all depends on how your baby is but yes these are the rough guidelines so 25000 you have to maintain for all newborns and 30000 we need to maintain for all newborns uh, in whom we are suspecting or we have proved that the baby has a, it's a case of neonatal allomene thrombocytopenia so the next slide we have Uh, about uh, management of uh, thrombocytopenia in a patient with neonatal allomene thrombocytopenia although in our setting it is we only uh, suspect it is very difficult to prove and previous uh, sibling history also most of the times we hardly ever have history we may just have a history of a neonatal death but we never somehow are able to make it out that whether it was because of an ic bleed but yes if a term baby who has an intracranial bleed we are somehow able to document in this child or in the previous sibling it is more or less that we take it as a baby must be having a neonatal allomene thrombocytopenia so for a, a baby without neonatal allomene thrombocytopenia maintain the levels above 25000 and for baby with a neonatal uh, uh, neonatal uh, allomene thrombocytopenia we maintain a platelet count beyond 30000 so this is an algorithm which tells us again ma uh, in management when we are saying that we need to transfuse platelet which are hpa type so that will not be possible in our setup so we just have to transfuse a random donor platelet whether the baby has a neonatal allomene problem or it is just uh, any other simple thrombocytopenia thank you ma'am so the next uh, like so when we are discussing transfusion platelet transfusion lot of um, a uh, discussion was there on prophylactic platelet transfusion so a child like even in this case the child was not there's no bleeding but you have decided to transfuse so again uh, dr siddharth welcome to the panel discussion 
um, what is the current evidence? So a lot of people have gone down on the, uh, the cutoff for transfusions nowadays. So what is the current evidence of uh, for platelet transfusions prophylactically? Okay, ma'am. Uh, so basically, what we need to understand is uh, why do we need prophylactic transfusions? As the gestational age goes down and as the birth weight goes down, there is a significant increase in the risk of bleeding. And especially we are concerned about avoiding intraventricular hemorrhage, which would be a catastrophe and would also lead to poor neurocognitive outcome in these babies as they grow up. So we have two recent trials. One is the PLANET trial, which uh, talked about the platelet transfusion thresholds in preterm newborns, which compared 25,000 and a higher threshold of 50,000 as the cutoff for platelet transfusion and showed that when you use a higher threshold for transfusion, it was associated with a greater risk of mortality bleeding as well as bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And another trial published from PGA Chandigarh, which compared a lower threshold and a higher threshold as cutoff affecting the closure of patent ductus aterosis did not show any difference between the two thresholds. Although the study showed that with more liberal transition, there was an increased intraventricular hemorrhage. The rate of severe intraventricular hemorrhage that is great than greater was not different between the two. So based on the two recent trials, we are using 25,000 as a cutoff for prophylactic pitted transmissions. Uh, next slide, please. But one thing which we, one caveat which we need to remember is most of these trials are studied beyond the first week of life. It is recommended in the more than seven days of um, old newborn. And the maximum risk of bleeding is often in the first one or two weeks. So there you might need to have a higher threshold based on the clinical scenario. This table from BCHS guidelines has already been shown prior. Thank you, Dr. Siddhar. I think that clears everything. I think it's been taken up by a couple of speakers and the cutoffs are very clear. Now, Dr. Hari, if we're calculating platelet transfusion, so in an older child, we usually use uh, one unit for 10 kilos, raises it by 10,000. That's the thumb rule that we usually follow. So in a newborn, how do you follow? Uh, how do you calculate um, how much to give? So, um, as uh, the standard uh, guideline says that uh, we should transfuse 5 to 10 ml uh, per kg. So, the body weight of the baby is very important in this and uh, the blood volume. So, uh, depending on that, we have to uh, give a power. We can have a pedi pack from the random mother platelet or we can have uh, uh, we usually have a inferosis platelet and make it a, into pedi packs of 3 and 4 bags and uh, at one point of time, uh, one day we give 5 to 10 ml for per ml per kg for uh, these children. So, so I think the point is like like in PRBC units, you can make similar small aliquoting. It can be done for platelets as well. Yes. Thank you. So, um, Dr. Sangeeta, ma'am, like there has been, you did mention about cross matching uh, for new units. Can you just briefly describe the principle like uh, whenever we are sending a, what would you, how would you try, like in this child, for example, this is a mother who is O positive and a baby is B. What is the principle behind doing both the samples together in the yeah. So uh, in this situation where the baby is, I think the baby is A and the mother is O. So the blood that we will give will be the O because it has to be compatible with both the mother and the baby's blood group. As the mother is O, she will have anti-A. So we cannot give A blood group to this baby. So what is important is that the baby does not have any antibody of its own. Whatever antibodies are there have come, come from the mother. That is why we stress that the sample has, the blood has to be compatible with both the mother and the baby. So we will, we will do the blood grouping, confirm the blood grouping in the baby and we will do the cross matching with the maternal sample and it has to be blood group O. Thank you. And this we will follow till four months. Yes. And one more thing. We, uh, in this case, we think that the child will need repeated transfusion. So we can uh, talk to the clinicians and we can dedicate one bag and we can start giving aliquots. And once the cross match is compatible with one aliquot, then all the repeat aliquots from the same bag can be given without repeating the cross match, taking care that there are no clerical um, problems in getting the blood or in issuing of the blood. Thank you, ma'am. So, Dr. Satyam, this is again a common issue. Like we don't have to, many a times we know that platelets need don't need ABO com compatibility, but we do insist on it. So, what? Why do you why do you think we do it? 
So uh, I think this was previously discussed by Dr. Hari as well that uh, our first priority to is to give ABO compatible uh, units to the newborns as these platelets also have ABO antigens. Though the number of ABO antigens are less as compared to a red cell. So we prefer giving an ABO compatible units. Yes, uh, in our setting, we do do a minor cross match to even to issue platelets in plasma, though that is not something which is universally followed at all the centers across the country and even internationally. Another thing that I would like to highlight is, is, the, is the blood group that we opt in case there is an incompatibility between the mother and the child and, uh, and the table clearly shows that which are the first options for uh, which of the platelets, plasma and Paxel. Uh, which groups can be used. So this is better that uh, whenever there is a cross the group transfusion, the clinicians and the transfusion medicine specialist, both are in consensus that what group will they be transfusing. Another important issue is platelet refractiveness. Well, this is in the pediatric uh, age group as the child grows and they are uh, having some other illness, maybe because of cancer or history of a lot of transfusion. So these are the causes of platelet refractiveness. When we transfuse these patients, there is incomplete uh, response to these platelet transfusions. So there is a concept of platelet cross match, which is relatively new, very few centers in the country who are doing it. And I was uh, at one of the centers before this place who, where we established and validated platelet cross match. So even in these scenarios, we can provide a compatible platelet cross matched unit uh, to a patient who is suffering from platelet refractiveness. So this is more when we have more oncology patients and we have more chronically transfused patients. So this is also an interesting part of platelet serology, which is growing up in India. So that uh, chart you mentioned was basically for non-availability, right? Yes, so for non-availability. Non -availability, you can go across the group across. and this is the second and third unit. So it is, we are uh, right in doing so. So um, Ruchi ma'am, we did discuss uh, PRBC a bit earlier also. Uh, could you just briefly mention again the triggers? When, when are we supposed to transfuse for a preterm or a term neonate? Mm -hmm. So we have uh, told the stringent guidelines when we talk about preterm newborns because they have been extensively studied across the world. Because all, uh, I think only one in ten transfusions in a NICU would be for a term baby. Rest all nine transfusions would be for a very low birth weight baby and a preterm child. So there are there are good studies. So the British Society also suggests guidelines for babies less than thirty two weeks. So you can see it on your screen. It depends on the baby's postnatal age. It depends on the gestation of the uh, baby. It depends on what respiratory support the baby is, whether it, he's on, uh, he or she is on uh, invasive or non-invasive ventilation, or the baby is off oxygen. When we come to term newborns, it has been recommended uh, by all societies that probably we can take the cutoffs of preterm babies uh, in the column in which we are recommending for off oxygen. So for a term child, first 24 hours, probably less than 10, we can uh, transfuse. And uh, we are in our unit, we are following this. This is from the AIM New Delhi protocol in which if the child has severe cardiac or pulmonary disease, which would include uh, complicated congenital heart diseases or the, uh, the child is on a good amount of ventilator support, then we will like to maintain the hemoglobin of the baby beyond 12. And if the baby is on moderate disease, that is the baby is on a, a invasive ventilation, but the uh, FIO2 and the pressure requirements are not too high, then probably 10 would be a good cutoff. And again, for major surgery, less than 10. Symptomatic anemia, symptomatic meaning that the baby, in spite of all good nutrition, exclusive breastfeeding and everything, there is no other reason and you find that the baby is not gaining good weight or the baby is having constant tachypnea or tachycardia, which cannot be explained by any other cause. So that would go into the category of symptomatic anemia in a term child. So these are the thresholds. But coming to this baby, uh, probably we may not have to transfuse for anemia, but if you remember the slide uh, one, the baby had a very high bilirubin level 18. So probably maybe not, maybe you may not have to uh, expose the baby to a blood unit for uh, anemia. But then we must remember that newborn is one age in which you may have to expose the newborn to a blood unit because of jaundice alone. So if you have a child you, uh, who's, uh, and then again we need, we have very uh, good and clear cut guidelines, what are the exchange transfusion cutoffs? And what are the phototherapy cutoffs? And this baby would definitely fall into the exchange transfusion cutoff day three, day four, I think. Less than one uh, or one kg, 18, they definitely would require exchange transfusion. So uh, these are the thresholds for anemia. 
and we have different thresholds for neonatal jaundice. Thank you, ma'am. So there has um, so over the years we have come from very liberal uh, transfusion practices. Like I think when we have all started studying, also you uh, most surgeons would ask for a hemoglobin of ten or a twelve for a surgery. From then it has now the guidelines have moved towards very very restrictive transfusion policies. So uh, could you briefly discuss uh, that uh, restrictive the how this has evolved, Dr. Siddharth? Yeah. So why do we have this debate? Uh, so when you give, why do you want to give blood transfusion to a baby? We believe that it will improve the oxygenation of end organs and maybe decrease the mortality and also enhance the neurodevelopment, prevent you know poor neurocognitive outcome. But the problem is that when you give blood transfusion, there are a whole lot of hazards which are associated with transfusion that we all know about. And also theoretically, the transfusion can lead to immune dysregulation and lead to some neonatal complications. And also the volume of the blood being given can lead to pressure variations in the blood vessels and lead to intraventricular hemorrhage. So that's why now a lot of studies have been done. And recently we have two excellent multicentric trials. One is the European trial studying the effects of transition thresholds on neurocognitive outcomes and the American transition of premature trials. Both compared high and low thresholds as per the week of life of the child, as well as the critical status or the respiratory support. And both showed that there was no difference in the neurodevelopmental outcome at uh, two years of age and also death. So both these trials clearly show that one should use a restrictive transition strategy in uh, extremely low birth weight babies. And we can follow the same table, which has been shown previously from the BCHS recommendations as per the uh, gestational age and as per the support that the child is having. Thank you, Dr. Siddharth. And this is regarding pediatrics, right? Yeah, yeah maybe we should come back to this and we're discussing the... Right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thank you. So, Dr. Hari, a uh, lot of children, uh, like this was discussed uh, by Dr. Sangeeta also, that you would kind of reserve a bag for uh, children who are neonates who are receiving transfusions. So, how can we avoid uh, repeated transfusions in newborns? What else can we do? So, uh... So this dedicated donor unit is uh, uh, one of the uh, established uh, method of reducing the donor exposure basically in uh, neonates. So what we can do is we can, at the outset, we can take a fresh whole blood bag and dedicate that bag for a, a particular unit after the repetition is received. And we can make a pedi bags from the red cells and even FFP and PC can be converted to pedi bags. And, uh, they can be uh, dedicated till the shelf life. So red cells uh, can be stored up to 42 days and FFP and uh, PC can be stored for five days. So all these uh, components can be dedicated to one uh, new unit. And uh, next slide, please. So we did this uh, study uh, during uh, Satyam's MD thesis. So uh, Satyam can uh, better explain this. He has done a lot of uh, hard work in this. So, uh, this uh, study uh, showed that the donor exposure definitely reduces when we dedicate all these units for one uh, children. So the donor exposure rate for dedicated donor unit was 1.15 as compared to four donor exposure each patient in a retrospective group, which we have compared used for the uh, as a comparator arm. So uh, one dedicated donor unit contributed to around 1.5 transfusion in each patient and 50% reduction in donor exposure. So this was uh, done in, uh, as a pilot uh, in, in PGI. So this can be done in uh, institutes uh, like uh, yours, uh, where Satyam is currently in. And uh, this can definitely reduce a donor exposure in a specific uh, group of populations because these patients usually get repeatedly sampled and they uh, have anemia uh, during their uh, hospital stay. So they require repeated transfusion. So uh, we can keep on using the same bag and the donor exposure will be lesser. We need not to cross match again and again uh, for these patients because if the same bag is given, we need not to cross match again. And the second, which we can do uh, to reduce a donor exposure is sticking to the guidelines. So it is very important uh, for uh, clinicians to understand that uh, these units are tested for the infections, they are not uh, uh, totally free from the infections like uh, the commercial drugs are, which are 
uh, petrol reduced and uh, because these technologies are still not available in our country and and uh, uh, evidence based use can definitely reduce the donor exposure thank you dr hari so uh... Sangeeta, ma'am, you did mention a bit about leukodepletion. So, if in this baby, for example, would you prefer a leukodepleted product in uh, neonates? Dr. Sangeeta? I think she is just lost her. She's joining back. I think we can take this question a bit later. So, it'll, I'll come to you, you Dr. Satyam. So uh, this was regarding leukodepletion. Another way of mod red cell modification is irradiation. So what is your take on irradiating blood products for uh, newborn babies? So irradiation is a, is, is a very important uh, product modification, which was briefly mentioned by Dr. Seema as well in her, in her presentation. So in this, we treat a red cell unit, majorly red cell and platelets with, a, uh, with irradiation, which is either can be from a radioactive source that is cesium or uranium, or maybe through an X-ray based irradiator. So this reduces the functionality of the T cells and the WBCs present in that bag. So they do not cause immune activation when they are transfused to an immunocompromised recipient. And in neonatology, uh, a, a newborn born after an intrauterine transfusion or a newborn who is born with uh, is is preterm and underweight is is a is a recipient is a candidate for receiving an irradiated blood components plus a newborn or a pediatric patient who has congenital immunodeficiency disorders uh, which may be either cellular uh, immunodeficiency thymic hypoplasia uh, wishcott aldrich syndrome in uh, infants with congenital uh, cardiac aortic arch defect so there are a lot of immune deficiency syndromes if the patient is suffering from these diseases they should receive uh, irradiated blood components as uh, that will not cause the blood transfusion will not cause any GVHD to them. So if, if there is no cardiac surgery, if there is no immunodeficiency and if it's a child who is not requiring IUT, would you still ask for... If the, would, if the child is, is preterm, then we may uh, we should consider irradiation. Otherwise, we should not. There is no specific recommendation. For that. Okay. Dr. Sangeeta, are you, are you connected now? Yes, ma'am. I'm the, I got this one. So we were discussing that question on leukodepletion. So uh, could you briefly tell us uh, how effective is leukodepletion? Would you recommend leukodepletion for newborn transfusion? Newborn yes. Uh, leuko leukodepletion is now the standard universal practice which is adopted in, very, in many Western countries. So one thing is that uh, one of the very important benefits of leukoreduction is that it decreases the CMV risk. So, uh, and also it reduces the FNHTRs, it reduces aluminization risk, though aluminization is not a major concern in the neonates up to four months of um, age. Then it also decreases the risks of trolley and other uh, infections um, uh, like HTLV, etc. So, uh, leukoreduction is important for neonates. Uh, we have to give leukodepleted blood products for all intrauterine transfusions, for all exchange transfusions. And then till the baby is four weeks of age, that is till one month of age, because we have to give him CMV negative, so it is better to give leukoreduction. So, in fact, in Britain, they are giving uh, CMV negative and leukoreduced blood uh, blood components till one year of age, which which is the universal guidelines which is following, which is being followed there. So, I think leukoreduction should be done for adults also. We um, we say that we should ideally give leukoreduced um, uh, blood components. It saves your blood at the end of the day. Yeah. So it's like you, ideally universal leukodepletion if possible. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. So these kind of children, like uh, the children who have significant um, hemolysis, neonatal jaundice uh, in the early neonatal period, many of them, and after a month or so, they end up having quite prolonged anemia. So it's called hyperregenerative anemia. So what is your opinion on this? And how do we follow these kind of children? Actually, Dr. Nita, uh, in the current day practice, we really don't uh, very commonly encounter these late onset hyperregenerative anemia due to ABO or RS incompatibility. ABO very rarely, RSD sometimes, and all of us know that RS incompatibility also is becoming 
वेरी वेरी रेयर सो दैट इट इज आई नो गाली टू डू आई चेंज ट्रांसफ्यूजन आफ्टर बीइंग स्पेंड हैविंग स्पेंट अ ईयर इन द हॉस्पिटल सो वी हार्डली एनकाउंटर आरएक्स सिग्निफिकेंट हिमोलिसिस ड्यू टू आरएक्स इनकम्पैटिबिलिटी बट यस वी डू सी रेयरली वी हैव वी हैव सीन चिल्ड्रन कमिंग एट 6 वीक्स ऑफ एज आल्सो हु हैव हैड एबीओ और आरएक्स इनकम्पैटिबिलिटी एंड probably not even uh, even if they have not required an exchange for that so there is some amount of hemolysis that is going on in their uh, in the system may not have required an exchange but uh, may have required just phototherapy so do we we do encounter but what we encounter more commonly is uh, premature and vlpw babies and most of them are with us only at one month of age also so uh, most of them we are discharging at 6 weeks or 8 uh, weeks so that why i would say is more common in uh, today's current practice so abrh uh, not very commonly but yes definitely and when we see them in the opd clinically we uh, look for pallor we are not advising routine hemoglobin or tcg so if the child looks clinically pale we advise them a hemoglobin investigation otherwise there is no routine uh, that after every uh, after every 7 days or 2 weeks we need to follow them up with a hemoglobin yeah thank you much baby for abo incompatibility in the newborn period given him phototherapy never uh, bilirubin never reaches up to the exchanging zone so very rarely we need an exchange transfusion most of the time just recover the support thank you ma'am so that is again so after this newborn period maybe that one to three months six months we do encounter a lot of these uh, troubled new newborn babies who end up with uh, severe anemia so dr siddharth your when do you advise um, how do you follow up these babies do you ask for phagocyte count do you need to wait how do you follow up these children yeah Uh, so basically, to answer this question, we have we can see from two perspectives. If you see from a neonatology per perspective, so most of these low birth weight babies, they will have a, a preponed physiological anemia, the anemia of prematurity, which tends to occur by around three to six weeks of age. So the first dictum is given that we are following a restrictive approach to transition. We need not be proactively sampling the child just to detect the anemia, and we should be sampling the child only if. there are clinical evidence you know like the child is having recurrent apnea there is unexplained vital instability or there is poor weight gain despite uh, feeding or there is a poor feeding or lethargy so like this clinical pointer should guide uh, testing the baby to avoid unnecessarily phlebotomy losses and once you detect the baby to have anemia we have the bcts guidelines which has already been shown in the new neonatal age group now beyond uh, one month of age Uh, when from a hematology oncological perspective as a specialist we usually we have to try to differentiate it is a hypoproliferative um, anemia or a hemolytic anemia so from the clinical uh, examination uh, children with dysmorphism should be tuned to picking up hypoproliferative whereas if there is ictus organomegaly should suspect hemolysis a complete cbc with indices retic count and peripheral smear would be to the starting thing to get a diagnosis and then transition will be based upon the clinical scenario what is the diagnosis in that particular baby thank you dr siddharth so now we come to the second case which would move on to a slightly older child now this is a 6 year old child i'll briefly describe the case it's a child with a short duration fever vomiting pain abdomen febrile flushed child um bp is 100 by 50 system seem okay she was started on maintenance fluid your reports show that it's dengue igm positive child is now admitted since a week now from the last two days there's been no fever but bp records are not good child is irritable abdomen is distended and the child is bleeding so again a common scenario that we see during the dengue season children coming with the mucosal bleeding bruises at many puncture sites hypotensive children so um, these are the investigations in this baby i think this child would have been transfused hemoglobin is 12 total count is 3500 platelet is 15000 now and there is some evidence of multi organ dysfunction raised sgo tsgpt urea is also high so dr siddharth will start from you a sick baby in a picu when do you advise transfusions quickly on prbc as well as platelets yeah so uh, dr sangeeta has already talked about the tri picu study so which compared a lower cutoff of 7 and a higher cutoff of 9.5 showed there was no significant 
difference in the outcomes. And there is also the recent taxi initiative, which actually recommends transitions in pediatric critical care. Um, so this says clearly says that if somebody has a hemoglobin less than five, then you have to transfuse. If somebody has HB seven or more, you can definitely wait. Now, those who have between five to seven, then you use your clinical judgment depending upon what support the child is on and what is the stability. Um, we usually go for packed red cells always, unless there is a hemorrhagic shock, like what you would see in dengue, where you might use whole blood or a combination of RBC uh, platelet and plasma. The only situations where you would want to use a higher cutoff that is more than seven would be in a child who also has an acute brain injury or a congenital heart disease or a hemolytic anemia like a sickle cell anemia or a thalassemia. Now, uh, coming to platelet count, uh, of course, it, it's very difficult to define the platelet count, but uh, we can go in this scenario. This is dengue. So definitely in dengue, what we know is we should not go for prophylactic transitions. The child is not bleeding if the count is less than 20,000. But if it is less than 10,000, then you might consider platelet transitions even if the child is not bleeding. And um, in dengue, basically, we consider blood transition if the hematocrit starts falling when you're resuscitating shock or there is a loss of more than 10% of the blood volume, in which case you can give whole blood or packed red cells. And like I already told about platelets, you can conserve less than 10,000 if no bleeding, if there is an ongoing systemic massive bleed or a prolonged shock with abnormal coagulogram. And the indication of FFP in dengue, you have to individualize. You might use it if their child is having significant bleeding with a coagulopathy. So again, the guidelines are similar to that we discussed earlier. And uh, it's just that you have to individualize based on the hemodynamic stability of the patient. So um, Dr. Hari, they, in many a time in pediatric care, we do see babies who are been giving, we have been giving transfusions, but the platelets simply mm -hmm. don't apply. Could you briefly describe what are the reasons for this refractory mode? Okay. Yes, so uh, uh, platelet reflectiveness is when we are uh, not getting the response over two consecutive ABO compatible uh, platelets transfused to the children and the CCI is less than uh, less than 7500 but uh, uh, it is uh, a bit difficult to uh, determine the uh, of the dose given to the uh, children because it is ml per kg and uh, we should know the uh, number of platelets transferred to the baby also to calculate the cci so uh, if uh, so these are the methods to calculate one is percentage platelet recovery and then uh, corrected count increment which includes the body surface area of the child uh, into account uh, uh, but uh, these are uh, a bit difficult to calculate in uh, this setup. We should uh, must be knowing the uh, exact platelet transfused to the uh, children, or otherwise we have to take the main platelets uh, like 5.5 and 10 per 10 if we are giving a random platelet. So the main reasons for uh, these are immune and non-immune, and most of the cases in uh, these uh, cases, the non-immune uh, cases are more like having fever and there's a bleed or if there's any drug going on like amphotericin or encomycin. So these are the non-immune reasons. So if we, if we find non-immune reason, maybe we have to increase the uh, plated dose. And if, if there's a new reason, which we will be able to find only when we do a plated cross match or uh, do a uh, 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 screen uh, the uh, patient's uh, serum sample for uh, anti HLA antibodies or anti platelet antibodies. And if we find those reasons, then we have to give uh, uh, cross match compatible or HLA match platelets, uh, which will be beneficial for these patients. Thank you. So, like in this child, it could be because of fever, it could be because of the dengue infection per se. If the child is in the pediatric ICU, their child might be on antibiotics. Like I think Pipracillin, Tazobactam, Manco are very common drugs that cause uh, platelet refractoriness. So all those things should be looked into. Thank you. So um, how do you calculate an expected rise? Like, so today I'm transfusing this six-year-old child. Um, he weighs, say, 20 kilos. And I'm transfusing in two RDPs. What is the expectation, uh, expected rise by tomorrow? So, uh, so the expected rise uh, 
so the amount of weight given so we, we should be knowing the uh, baby's um, weight the body surface area and so we can uh, definitely because uh, some of the platelets go into the spleen so we can uh, calculate the expected rise from percentage platelet recovery uh, which is usually 30 percent in these children so uh, that that formula can be used uh, as handy for calculating the expected rise and uh, yes, so this recovery around 30 percent post one hour of transfusion yes that is what you're saying Thank you. So um, we go on to the next uh, thing, like uh, Dr. Sangeeta, you, we did mention single donor platelets, both for newborn as well as for other older age groups. So this is again a common um, question, like a lot of us are, we need to come to donors. Um, so how do you, what all can we uh, tell them? Like what are the donor criteria for single donor platelets? Uh, yeah, so as uh, Dr. Dhawan has already explained about the single donor platelets, so this is roughly the six times the random donor platelets. So these single donor platelets, um, uh, achha, what you are, okay, yeah. so the donor criteria uh, for the single donor platelets is a donor should weigh at least 50 kg for the um, uh, uh, for platelet pheresis procedure. And then apart from the apheresis, um, this thing, he should meet all the donors for uh, donor criteria for allogenic blood donor um, um, blood donation like he should be fit or all, all the criteria that we do for allogenic blood donation all those criteria should be met that we will take the history of jaundice malaria tuberculosis all infections sexual history high risk history all those histories which we take in the allogenic donor criteria so apart from that the weight of the donor has to be more than 50 kgs then for the um, uh, interval between the platelet count has to be normal and now the drug controller also suggests that they you should also do tlc dlc um, uh, um, before uh, doing the platelet pheresis then the donation interval between the two platelet pheresis is 48 hours and one cannot do it more than twice in a week and not more than 24 times in a year another important thing that i uh, forgot to mention is that the donor should be off um, aspirin or any salicylates for at least more than three days or any other antiplatelet drugs as per the donor deferral criteria. So during dengue season, we can safely tell them that they can donate once in every 48 hours. If yes, to. every 48 hours they can donate, but not more than twice in a week or 24 times in a year. Sure. Thank you, ma'am. So we go on to the third case now. This is a, sorry, this, uh, this is a child. I think there's some problem in this slide, but I'll just briefly describe the case. This is a child, a four month old baby, who was transfused uh, uh, for he was uh, a four month old baby who presented with severe anemia to a, a, a pediatric hospital. And he was found to have a Plate uh, hemoglobin of 3.6 and the child was transfused immediately because of the severe anemia. Subsequently, on evaluation, the child was found to have a splenomegaly and the, child, the parents, they were sent home. And a month later, the child has presented to us with again pallor and this time the hemoglobin is 7 gram percentage and uh, there is a splenomegaly of around 5 centimeters below the axis. So, uh, Dr. Siddharth, very, very common scenario. This is that area type age group when we do see thalassemia coming in and so if it's already transfused child how do we proceed with the um, rest how do we proceed with the evaluation yeah uh, so this is a common problem we know that the rbc lifespan is 120 days and ideally one should be waiting for the time of the rbc lifespan to be doing a hemoglobin variant analysis but in the thalassemia major child who's going to require transition often every monthly it's going to be very challenging so one thing is you do the hb variant analysis just prior to the next transmission and at this point of time we can definitely test the parents because we would expect both of them to be thalassemia traits on the hemoglobin variant analysis and again we should also offer genetic testing which will also help this family in the antenatal diagnosis for the future pregnancy and then of course once you establish a diagnosis one will offer a transition plan uh, for these children which should be in the can we go to the next slide uh, that would be in the form of a periodic transition regimen which should be offered two to five weeks often it is around three to four weeks to maintain a pre-transition hemoglobin of 
9 to 10.5 gram per deciliter. And uh, I'm sure my other colleagues will describe this. There will be extended red cell antigen typing done before the first transmission. Prior to every transmission, we should do antibody screening to avoid aluminization in them. And it is very important to stress maintaining of a thalassemia diary where you actually note the date of the transition, how much volume was transfused, so that at the end of each year, you can actually see how much is the transition requirement. And it is mandatory to give leukodepleted products to these uh, children. And then, of course, we offer ion chelation therapy once uh, we complete 10 to 20 transitions or the ferritin goes up in these children. Thank you. That's very brief and uh, to the point. So, um, Dr. Ruchi, ma'am, this is a child who has come at three months of age and three months of age with severe anemia. What are the other differences that you would consider at that? Uh, as my uh, last comment also, I would first like to know whether this child was a very low workload or preterm child because in my office practice, that is the commonest cause of anemia which I encounter at one month or even two months or three months. So if this child was a very low workload, premature baby, then that would be just an exaggerated physiological anemia of uh, prematurity. And uh, just briefly, I would like to say that Delayed cord clamping, administration of injection vitamin K at birth, and very, very restrictive phlebotomy. Uh, no routine investigations to be done, and initiation of iron supplementation at two weeks in all preterm babies will really go a long way in preventing any transfusion that we may need for physiological anemia because this is a very natural thing in the most of the babies. Once they have reached their nadir, will start automatically picking up. But many times, not many times, it will be really. Uh, do readmit these preterm babies just for transfusion because the hemoglobins have dropped to as low as 5 or 6 also. And another common thing which is not mentioned in the slide that I would like to mention a child coming with anemia, uh, my, and if it's in uh, uh, months of summers uh, from May to October probably, malaria would be a very, very important uh, differential in my uh, in my opinion that the child has clean so, uh, malaria and it is not rare, it may be congenital more commonly, postnatally acquired malaria would be uh, very common, not a very common, but after that second BD, I would keep us that. And then obviously thalassemias, the earlier alpha thalassemia will present much earlier and beta thalassemia will present more than three months of age. Then again, uh, bone marrow hypoplasias like diamond blackman syndrome can present in neonatal age also. And rare causes like this, uh, that like congenital dyserythropoietic anemias. They have to be kept in mind. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. So, thals can, thalassemia can present a little early, and uh, physiological anemia itself can go a little late. So, there is that borderline period. So, uh, Dr. Satyam, how do we initiate? A bit of it has been discussed, but briefly, how do you initiate transfusion in thalassemia? Maybe? So this was this is continuing from Dr. Siddharth that we need to confirm that the case is, is of thalassemia and then uh, we need to establish it through the uh, hemoglobin testing as well that it is less than seven on two different occasions and at minimum more than two weeks apart. And uh, then the critical cutoff for transfusion in these suspected patients are seven. So if the hemoglobin drops below seven, we will definitely transfuse. And even if it is above seven and there are features of facial changes, poor growth, some associated factors or some extramedullary hematopoiesis, even then we will consider a transfusion. And yes, before we go for a first transfusion, we would request to have a complete uh, RH and KEL phenotyping as well as an as far as possible extended uh, rare blood group uh, phenotyping as well. So we know that what is the baseline uh, rare blood group phenotype of these patients. As once we start transfusion policies, the, the doing a phenotype will not be possible. Even an antibody screen, there is uh, no single guideline that it, at what interval should they be done. It's basically institutionalized. So they can come at a three months, six months, or even an annual basis to these patients. Our goal will be to keep a hemoglobin of more than 9.4 and we'll assess to, you know, retransfuse in between three to four weeks. And uh, based on pre-transfusion hemoglobin, our volume is usually decided. So if it is seven, we do 20 ml per kg. If it is uh, around nine, less than 9.5. Uh, so it's around 15 to 20, between 9.5 and 10.5 is around 15. And if it is more than 10.5, we do around, uh, we, con we uh, consider reducing the transfusion volume to a total 15% of the patient's body weight. 
Thank you, Dr. Satyam. So initially, first two transition seven, and then after that, uh, keep the hemoglobin above 9.5. Dr. Sangeeta, ma'am, again, thalassemia patients, what are the PRBC modifications that are commonly done? Okay, so uh, for the packed red cells in thalassemia patients, this has already been discussed by Dr. Siddharth and Dr. Satyam. So every time we, uh, one thing is never use whole blood use red cells packed red cells which are leuco reduced now leuco reduction particularly in thalassemia uh, uh, has a big role in reducing alloimmunization so uh, leuco reduced packed red cells are to be used for thalassemia second thing is whenever we are starting them on the transfusion regime it is a very good practice to have their phenotype with us either the phenotype or by the molecular test serological or molecular tests we should know what is their phenotype so second thing is every time uh, we, uh, we issue them the blood or on periodic basis antibody screen and identification should be done and they should be given antibody negative corresponding antigen negative blood. Another important concept which is not universally done is phenotypically matched blood. That is whatever is the RHKL profile of the thalassemic child, we give the same profile matched blood to the child. This reduces the incidence of alloimmunization. This also reduces the incidence of autoimmunization. So, so much so that the alloimmunization rate reduces from 15% to 3% after the use of phenotypically matched bloods. So I think that is what we need to do for the, and obviously we need to have a routine and they need to be transfused as um, um, uh, on their periodic basis as Dr. Satyam just said. Thank you, ma'am. So, leuco depletion, Dr. Harry, we could either leuco deplete um, at the blood bank or when we do it at, at the transfusion daycare. So, how do you decide which one is better according to you? So, when the standard of care is uh, pre store a leuco reduction only uh, with the inline filter. So, the bags already have the filter inside. So, after completion of complete preparation, we just hand the bag upside down and have a leuco filtered bag. So, what it does is that it removes the WBCs as a whole, so with the, before they, they can uh, release the cytokines or they can be WBC fragments. So this is the standard of care worldwide, it is used, but in our country, we don't have the whole inventory as liquid reduce. So maybe some uh, blood groups, we will not have a liquid reduce bag. So in that case, we can use uh, this uh, lab side or bed side liquid reduction also. This is equally effective, uh, they say, uh, uh, for prevention of uh, uh, HLA illumination. So if we are doing lab side leukofiltration also within within uh, 72 hours, but uh, definitely pre-store leukofiltration reduction is the ideal if it is available. And if, if lab side is not available, then bedside leukofiltration is uh, being done almost everywhere for the thalassemia patients. So, uh, so this will reduce the uh, cost also because the bags with inline leuco filters have a uh, lower cost. Uh, so if we are doing lab side or bedside leuco filtration, we can move to this place for it uh, inline leuco filter bags, uh, which which will be uh, uh, which will pose less cost to the patient uh, uh, for leuco reduction, the better leuco reduction. Thank you. So it's the same filter, but it's less costlier if you do it in the blood bank and um, it's more effective. So when we're selecting a filter, what are the criteria that we should look for, Dr. Satya? So uh, as Dr. Hari has said that we would prefer a, 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 a pre-storage filtration that can be either uh, our bag has a filter or we use a lab filter to you know, customize our inventory that we know how many units that we want to filter and do a leuco reduction. And uh, this was one of the studies which we did uh, and published few years back in which we calculated the amount of leuco reduction through flow cytometry. And uh, we compared two companies uh, degree of leuco reduction. And we found that it was almost 99.9% .9 leuco reduction which was achieved by both the companies. And at that time, these were the two main companies which were providing uh, the leuco reduction bags. So, there is no specific uh, criteria that we look into it. Yes, we want third generation or fourth generation uh, bed, bedside or uh, lab side leuco filters or even the filters which is attached with the blood bag. So it depends on how do we want to make our inventory. Okay, thank you. So um, if you are selecting a, a filter, for example, 
how do you know if the filter is working or not like do you in the blood bank do you check the wbc after a filtration dr hari dr hari you have to unmute yourself sorry uh, so as a, a part of routine quality control also uh, we must be uh, checking uh, the fe efficiency of these uh, leak reduction filters and at the time of uh, maybe purchasing these bags we should definitely do that uh, are these uh, leak filters working appropriately are they giving us a 99.9% or three log leak reduction so the method because the wbc uh, content of these bags is very low it's thousand time lower than the normal so normal cell counters won't work even newer chamber is very have a 1 microliter blood volume so uh, we will not be able to uh, catch the wbc count on that so we uh, need a special uh, chamber called negoti chamber so this is a very costly chamber but it is one time investment and the wbc counting can be done in this so uh, this this is specifically for specifically for uh, uh, leuk reduced blood component and be uh, even better method is flow cytometry which uh, uh, explained in previous slide they did so uh, flow cytometry is superior to negoti chamber but if flow cytometry is not available we can use negoti chamber and calculate the residual wbcs and uh, check the quality of these these uh, filters so running a cbc will not help if we should get our blood bank uh, colleagues help and get a quality control done even if we are doing a bedside filtration so dr um, siddhar so when we use blood bedside filter in the ward what are the common uh, problems that you encounter and what can, can you quickly uh, tell us how to avoid the problems of a bedside filter yeah uh, i think one major problem we face is the cost it's not always available uh, covered free of cost in all parts of the country so you can see it costs around almost 600 to 1500 and some may not be up so it's still cheaper that we the institute tries to do a pre uh, you know pre bedside filtration at the blood bank level itself now the problems here is when the uh, when we are connecting the blood through the filter we should make sure that we uh, the air is not coming we should prime the entire filter with blood before we connect to the patient because once there is air inside that will in, uh, interfere with the performance of the filter and also often what Uh, some uh, nursing staff or the doctors might tend to do is they will squeeze the bag so that the filter gets primed very fast so again that is not correct because if when you squeeze the blood bag you might be activating the wbc releasing deleting cytokines and leading to febrile reactions and another problem is sometimes um, despite our best efforts debris can adhere to the filter and obst obstruct the function yeah and i think a lot of times when we are giving two units we should either use a double filter or you should two different two different filters many a times the patient they if their patient is paying many a times we end up um, using the same filter for two units that is not a recommended practice at all thank you and quickly dr satyam we don't have a luxury of irradiation for all patients so in thalassemia patients when they are getting transfused when will you advise irradiation absolutely absolute indication so uh, irradiation will be absolutely indicated when we are planning a bone marrow transplant for a thalassemia patient as it is not recommended routinely but yes if we have a match donor and we are preparing a patient for transplant then we will have to switch that patient to all irradiated blood components pre as well as uh, post. post in the transfusion period so i'll skip the cell luminization question and come to the last case which is transfusing transfusion in a cancer patient so this is a 8 year old girl with uh, recently diagnosed myeloid leukemia she is presented with gum bleeding and occasional uh, gum bleeding has been continuing even after being started on uh, uh, induction cycle 1 now the there is one episode of black colored stools also So, Dr. Siddharth, recently diagnosed myeloid leukemia with mucosal bleeding. What are your your possibilities? What are the blood products that you will keep ready when you are starting induction? Yeah. So, when we see um, any oncology child with a bleeding, the we can divide the causes as either disease related, especially like in hematological malignancies. One would see thrombocytopenia per se because of the marrow involvement, and some conditions, particularly acute promyelocytic leukemia and monocytic AML, we can actually have. coagulopathy and disseminated intravascular coagulation also and in children who have hyperleukocytosis and leukemia they are particularly prone to having life threatening bleeding in the brain and the lungs and in these patients especially we have to maintain a higher platelet cutoff of 
30 to 50,000 when you have a hyperleukocytosis. Then on the other hand, you also have treatment related. The chemotherapy that we give also leads to myelosuppression and thrombocytopenia. And the chemotherapy can also lead to mucositis, which can also increase the risk of bleeding. And one thing which is not there in the slide is neutropenic enterocolitis, because in this index case, there is blood in stools. That is, again, another differential for bleeding. So uh, there are different uh, heterogeneous cutoffs, but what we practice at CMC, is so if there is a less than 7 gram per deciliter, then we would transfuse uh, for anemia. And in an afebrile stable child, we use a 10,000 cutoff for plated, whether if the child is unstable, highly febrile or having bleeding, then we would transfuse at even less than 20,000. I think we'll keep platelets, uh, FFP, cryo, everything ready if you're treating a myeloid leukemia. Uh, mm -hmm. Just in case you may require it if there is mucosal bleeding. Yeah. Just to add one thing, sorry, in APML, we have to maintain fibrinogen levels more than 150 to 200 by giving FFP or cryoprecipitate. Yes, thank you. So Dr. Sangeeta, um, I think a little bit of it was answered. Active cancer patient, what are the triggers for back as well as platelets? So, uh, uh, Dr. Siddharth has already said that uh, for platelet transfusions in uh, in non-infected clinically stable children, then the at profile uh, we will give prophylactic platelet transfusions at ten thousand, and uh, in other conditions as as per the BCSS guidelines, which have already been discussed by Dr. Siddharth. Then for the red cell transfusions, the it is uh, um, there are no um, there is not much of evidence, but the depending on the clinical stability of the patient the hemoglobin cutoff threshold is kept somewhere between seven to eight so that is to be based on the clinical judgment and chemotherapy as well as radiotherapy would be yes. taken in the treatment irradiation dr satyam how do you make a couple of fish questions in this thing as in a cancer patient would you irradiate all products what is the dose after irradiation and what is the expiry of the product so uh, we would uh, only radiate the cellular products, which are uh, Paxel and the platelets. The plasma does not go under, or even trap precipitate are not irradiated. And uh, these are done to stop the proliferation of T cells so that they do not overtake the immune of the recipient. Uh, the dose which is given is 25 grays, and from the day of irradiation, the expiry changes to 28 days, or the date of expiry, which come whichever is the first. So if I, uh, it is better that we irradiate fresher units, so they are available for a longer shelf life to these patients. And yes, uh, higher potassium is a is a big concern. So we do not tend to keep these irradiated units for longer time on our shelf. We tend to move them as fast as possible. There was some discussion on 24 hours earlier. You know? That was for uh, for newborn. For newborn going for exchange fund. For a newborn, irradiated. Yes, if for irradiation, if we are using it for uh, newborn or intrauterine transfusion, since it increases the potassium levels, we have to use it within 24 hours in those scenarios. Okay, thank you, ma'am. And uh, finally, Dr. Harry, this is a child who has would probably be having coagulopathy, myeloid leukemia. Quickly, how do you decide FFP versus cryo in this scenario? Or should it be always FFP first followed by cryo if not improved? So it is uh, FFP as it is a base product uh, and it contains uh, all the clotting factors, one interaction of all the clotting factors uh, per ml. So it can be uh, uh, you chosen as a first product and uh, the cryo maybe can be added later uh, if the fibrogen levels are uh, less than um, uh, one gram per liter or uh, for specifically uh, for uh, APML uh, uh, that the uh, fibrogen levels are lesser in those patients. So in that case, we can uh, use the cryo at the outset also. So the first is that uh, FFP, uh, can be used for many indications. So, uh, as a, a reconstitution uh, uh, product for exchange transfusion, uh, yes, as discussed in uh, uh, guidelines, that multiple coagulation factor deficiency like DIC, we can use FFP. Uh, vitamin K deficiency, yes, uh, earlier we can use FFP, but 
PCCs are now available. Uh, single uh, population factor deficiency FRP is being used till uh, from 60s, but now the signal factors are available. But for factor five deficiency, uh, we don't have a, a single population factor uh, available at uh, the commercial available. So we have to use FRP in that case. Yes, TTP is a very important indication of uh, 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 FRP transfusion and exchange with FFP because it replaces the ADAMPS13, which is the uh, uh, deficient protein in uh, TTP. So all these are the uh, definitive indications of FFP. Uh, next slide. So this, I think you mentioned. Yes. I think one important thing you mentioned was that whenever it, bleeding is not improving, check fibrinogen and fibrinogen, if it is low, cryo than FFP. Yes. Thank you. I think we'll wind up the panel discussion. We are still, um, yeah, we've still managed 10 minutes late. So this is uh, the whole um, uh, point of this panel discussion was to ensure that as in to discuss, uh, highlight the points that uh, we should be using blood very, very judiciously and not use um, as top up transfusions are no longer practice. Fresh blood is no longer practice. A lot of things have changed. Uh, dramatically in transfusion medicine from in the last uh, probably two decades. And we should never be using uh, blood transfusion sets also. And I think another point we did not discuss is blood being issued to the ward and kept open there. And uh, so whenever a bag is open, how um, this is just an impromptu question, how, how in, within how many hours should you use it? So any bag which is issued from the blood bank needs to be started transfusion within 30 minutes of issue should complete transfusion within four hours. And you should always use the BT set, which is 170 So suppose it's a small baby and there is no pedi bag facility. If a bag is issued, you say you want only 50 hours. Can you use that blood bag? Can you keep it in the refrigerator, use it the next day? That Ideally is not, but yes, within 24 hours. You can use. Okay. okay, thank you, Dr. Satyam. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you, Dr. Sangeeta. Thank you, Dr. Hari. Thank you, Dr. Siddharth. And thank you, ma'am, Ritu, ma'am, for the excellent discussion. I'll stop here and I'll request thank you, ma'am. Take up the questions. New. Hello, everyone. Is there any queries about the discussed uh, case summaries? Yeah, there is some questions. Uh, Ashish. Yes, I can see there, uh, Dr. Ashish Pradhan, he has a query. Can we view the presentation in YouTube link? Yeah. Yeah, it's there. You can uh, surely uh, see, it, uh, see it on the YouTube. The second query is from Sandeep Nigam. Can we get a chart of mothers and baby blood group for platelets and FFP? Sure, we will uh, uh, we'll forward you through mail. And uh, the next query, query is by Dr. Ashish Pradhan again. And uh, he is asking about how to suspect Rali in already sick neonates, other than restrictive transfusion, any other methods for reducing Rali? I think Dr. Sangeeta may answer this question. Dr. Sangeeta. Sir, uh, can I have the question again? Ma'am, you need to unmute. Ma'am, what is the question? Ma'am, you have to unmute your mic. Yeah. I am unmuted. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, what is the question? How to suspect Rally in already sick neonates? So, the, the thing is, um, if the child already has respiratory distress, then uh, uh, it is very difficult uh, to, uh, even in a the diagnosis of Rally is tricky, and we have the different imputability levels. That is how sure we are that it is trolley or whether it was already coexisting respiratory condition. So if the child has the respiratory distress with fall in SpO2, then we can suspect trolley and we need to do the chest x-ray. But the, to say that it was due to the blood uh, transfusion, it is difficult to say. Basically, it is unexpected deterioration. If, we, uh, if the baby develops an unexpected deterioration in the respiratory condition, Obviously, the child is already very sick and uh, then uh, already on maximum ventilator support or already on maximum FIU support by non-invasive method. 
uh, then it will be difficult. But if you find that there are certain uh, changes in the X-ray, or you have to suddenly increase the ventilator settings, in those conditions, we can suspect that this baby may be having trouble. Otherwise, uh, there could be any uh, different criteria of the child to be delayed. Uh, thank you, Sangeeta, ma'am. I think Dr. Nigam has got his answer. And uh, he has some more queries about uh, platelet uh, storation. He want to ask that whether platelets can be stored in refrigerator for some time. No, platelets uh, platelet should never be stored platelet in refrigerator. Platelets should never be stored in refrigerator. It's 20 degrees. Yeah, it's the platelet needs to be stored between 20 to 24 degrees with continuous agitation. So that is ideally to be stored in a platelet incubator, which is present with the blood banks. Uh, the other thing is, uh, can we transport platelets in thermocol box in the other city, in a gap of three to four hour journey? So we don't actually recommend transporting platelets to uh, such a long journey because maintaining appropriate temperature at that long journey will not be optimal. So that is not something which is recommended from the blood bank side. I think uh, the question from Dr. Nigam has been well answered. So I don't find any other queries. We will upload those on the website. And uh, there's one more query about uh, uh, the compatible neonate and mother blood group chart for platelets and FFP transfusion. Uh, definitely, Dr. Sandeep, we will upload it on the website. So you can download it. Exactly mail it to me. Or we can uh, mail you privately as we have got your mail. So uh, now I am uh, giving over to Dr. Yuganta to end the session. Sir, please. Um... Sir, kindly unmute yourself. Uh, sorry, once again. Um, thank you, everybody, for giving such a nice presentation and such informative uh, session it was. And, uh, and it is also a little bit, uh, sessions are very good fun in day-to-day -day practice. We don't get such a good seminars for on this topics. And so uh, thank you, everybody, for organizing such a nice CMEs. And I hope and in the future we will keep on getting our knowledge updated through all your uh, so sincere efforts. Thank you, everybody. Okay, sir. We'll wind up the session today. Um, I would request Professor D.K. Gupta, sir, to say... By the time, sir, connect um, unmutes, I would like to thank all the esteemed uh, speakers, the panelists, and the chairpersons who joined us today. To all the delegates who have stayed throughout the program, we did hit around 98 uh, delegates, which was very good for this uh, topic. And um, I would like to thank uh, National Academy of Medical Sciences uh, for the support, for, to Project ECHO for their continued support over the last one year, to uh, Blood Cell NHN uh, for supporting patients with thalassemia and hemophilia. That's how we started this program for um, training for hemoglobinopathies. And, um, we wind up the program. My thanks once again to all the speakers, to all the chairpersons and all the delegates who have joined in today. Uh, DK Gupta, sir. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Nita. I have been just in and out, but uh, more so listening rather than uh, on the video. Thank you, sir. Appreciate and see you tomorrow. So tomorrow, I believe you are holding uh, the symposium from National Academy's auditorium. Yes. Okay. It's all yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. All the participants. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Thank Ranjan, you, Dr. Yoganta, Dr. and Dr. our Dr. team Dr. from Noida Children Hospital. Say my hello to everybody. They have done a wonderful job, especially the blood bank people and your staff from the Meta Oncology. Co -organized. Great job. Well done. And Dr. Satya Marora. I forgot to mention my mistake. Thank you very much. And uh, we...
बिल्कुल ये बस एक इनको वो आया 